Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as the supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you on us who are members of this Senate, and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to some prejudices and personal affections. We may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Oath or affirmation announcements by the President, bills brought from the House of Representatives, petitions, papers. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers listed on the other paper in the name of the Minister of Finance, the Corporation Tax, Small and Medium Enterprises Loan Guarantee Program, Extension of Exemption Order 2021. I thank you. Reports from committees urgent questions. Senator Mark. Thank you, Madam President. To the Honorable Minister of Finance, in light of reports that Carl Caribbean Airlines has taken the decision to reduce its staff by approximately 450 employees, can the minister indicate what support systems will be made available to said employees? Minister Finance. Thank you, Madam President. Caribbean Airlines is currently at the beginning of the consultation process in relation to the proposed reduction in staff and is finalizing the exact number of personnel. In preparation for this, the company is currently putting in place a number of support systems for any potentially affected employees. These would include counseling services for employees and their family through the Employee Assistance Program, outplacement services to be coordinated with external recruiting agencies and the Ministry of Labor, transition training with respect to care guide, career guidance and support and financial management, in addition to the compensation packages that the employees would be entitled to upon separation. Can I ask the Honorable Minister, through you, whether the executive management team will be um, candidates for reductions or adjustments in their compensation packages, Madam Sen President? Senator Mark, that question does not arise. Can I go on to the next question? Yes, sure. To the Honorable Minister of Finance, can the Minister indicate how the retrenchment and severance packages of the approximately 450 CAL workers who are earmarked for retrenchment will be financed. Thank you. Madam President, Caribbean Alliance does not have the required finances for the severance payments and therefore the severance payments will be financed by the Ministry of Finance. Senator Mark. Can I ask the Honorable Minister, given the approximate numbers involved, has the government, or I should say, is the Minister aware whether the Board has worked out the value as it relates to the amount that would be paid out if this figure holds of 450 workers or employees. Minister of Finance. Yes. 
the estimate given to the Ministry of Finance at this time, which is subject to finalization, is in the vicinity of $110 million. Can I ask the Honorable Minister whether the government intends to work with all the parties involved in that company to ensure that the impact on retrenchment of workers can be seriously minimized, Madam President. Senator Mark, that question does not arise. Next question, Senator Mark. Can, to the Honorable Minister of Finance, can the Minister indicate how will the retrenchment of approximately 450 car workers impact the airline's operations when the borders are reopened in mid-July? Minister Finance. Thank you, Madam President. Caribbean Airlines has advised the Ministry of Finance that passenger demand on its routes as projected by IATA, the International Air Transport Association, and its external consultants, Amadeus, to decrease in the short and medium term, so that it is expected that passenger demand will decrease in the near future and for the next year or so. I am advised that traffic is expected to return to pre-COVID levels in or around 2023. And this is based on advice from IATA and the consultants Amadeus. As a result, CAL plans to reduce its network and fleet size to match the passenger predictions given to it by its consultants. When the borders are reopened, Caribbean Airlines will have a reduced jet fleet and a, and a reduced ATR fleet, and will therefore service fewer routes than pre-COVID. Any separation of workers is directly as a consequence of the reduction in the fleet size and the reduction in the routes. Cal will therefore fly fewer frequencies and fewer routes. I wish to assure the Senate, and I have been advised, and I believe it to be so, that notwithstanding the reduction in the size of the airline, the routes that will be operated will be done at the highest levels of safety and service. Can the Honourable Minister advise this Senate whether he is aware of the number the, as regards to the fleet size can the minister indicate what would be the level of reduction, Madam President? I can answer that. Minister. Thank you. I'm advised, and I must say I am saddened by all of this. This is not something that any of us would have wanted to see. I'm advised that Caribbean Airlines is going to reduce its jet fleet to eight jet aircraft and its Turbo prop fleet to five ATRs. And Madam President, may I ask the Honorable Minister, how will this reduction from the consultant's perspective impact on passengers who may wish to access the airline during this period of renewal? recovery, structural streamlining? I'm advised, Madam President, if you will allow me to answer that supplemental. I'm advised that Caribbean Airlines has been in discussions with its external consultants, Amadeus, who are one of the leading airline consultants in the world for many months now because of the projections for reduced air traffic even when COVID is over and all routes are reopened. And it is expected that this fleet of eight jet aircraft and five ATRs, I'm advised that Caribbean Airlines has been advised by its consultants and by IATA 
that will be adequate to manage any passenger demand, and therefore, persons should be able to access flights on CALS routes in similar fashion than they do now. However, there will be fewer flights and fewer routes, but the demand will also be less. And therefore, I'm told that Caribbean Alliance has been advised that this fleet configuration will be adequate to service the future demand and provide the required level of service to passengers. And Senator Ma. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. To the Honorable Minister of Foreign, Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, given the announcement of the government of Barbados to establish, in inverted commas, a travel bubble for specific Caribbean countries with a low incidence of COVID-19 cases, close quote, can the minister indicate the effect this decision will have on travelers from Trinidad and Tobago to Barbados? Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, this is what has been described as not a travel bubble in the strictest interpretation of the word. The government of Barbados has announced that effective June 30th, 2021, fully vaccinated persons with a negative PCR test coming from specific countries with low incidence of COVID-19 can enter their country without any further tests on arrival. Travelers from countries that do not currently meet their criteria, such as Trinidad and Tobago, will be subject to the existing protocols. Under those protocols, travelers from Trinidad and Tobago, vaccinated or unvaccinated, must present a negative result from a PCR test taken three days prior to arrival in Barbados. The unvaccinated traveler will be required to quarantine for five days at a designated approved property. A PCR test is then administered at the end of this period. If the result is negative, the traveler may then leave quarantine after five days. The vaccinated traveler from Trinidad and Tobago, this is referring to what currently obtains. The vaccinated traveler from Trinidad and Tobago is administered a second PCR test on arrival in Barbados. If the result is negative, the traveler may then leave the designated quarantine location. That result is normally obtained within 24 hours. Accordingly, there is no additional challenge anticipated for travelers from Trinidad and Tobago to Barbados under the announced regime, which will be effective from June 30th, 2021. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Mark, the time for urgent questions has expired. Questions on notice, questions for oral answer. Leader of Government Business, very much, Madam President. Madam President, there are three questions on notice for response today. The government will respond to all three. Senator Mark. Question number 120 to the Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Leader of Government Business. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, the government does not have a policy to phase out super gasoline. That was a proposal made by the technocrats of the Ministry of Ed Energy and Energy Industries, and that proposal was not accepted by the government. Thank you. Can the minister confirm or deny that this policy to phase out super gasoline is currently before the cabinet F and G P committee? I won't allow that question. All right, Madam President, may I rephrase it? Can I ask the Honorable Minister whether this policy has been completely rejected by the Cabinet 
of Trinidad and Tobago? Senator Mark, I won't allow that question. Is the minister aware, Madam President, through you, that this policy is properly before the cabinet for a decision? So, Senator Mark, I didn't allow the two previous supplemental questions based on the question that was posed and the answer that was given. And you're just, you're on to your third supplemental and you're asking basically the same thing that I've disallowed previously. Can I ask, my final question, can I ask the Honorable Minister, through you, Madam President, whether he can give this Senate the assurance that this decision that was published or this proposed decision that was published in the regular newspapers, can the minister categorically state that that particular proposal is no longer being considered by the government, Madam President? Senator Mark, for the same reason, that question isn't allowed. Next question, Senator Mark. Question number 121 to the Minister of Works and Transport. Minister of Works and Transport. The Bridges Landslip and Traffic Management Unit is currently addressing a critical landslip along the Naparima Mayaro Road, Craignish Village. All fieldwork and preliminary designs have been completed. It is estimated that final designs should be completed by the end of July 2021, following which a tender document will be prepared and tenders will be invited for the project. Thank you. Senator Mark. Yeah, I'm happy with that. No? Can I go on, ma'am? Yes. Yeah, question number 122 to the Honorable Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam President. The government has secured loan financing in the amount of $200 million to meet outstanding payments for goods and services procured by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service in 2020 and 2021. This is in addition to a total revised allocation of $382,539,845 for this line item, which is head 64, subhead 02, item 001, making a total of $582,539,845 are available to the TTPS in fiscal 2021 for past and current payments for goods and services. A supplementary allocation of $4,512,329 has also been made for the TTPS for debt service payments under the line item head 64-04-011 on the loan that will become due later in 2021. The first disbursement of $32,853,087.67 for outstanding TTPS payments has already been made out of this $200 million loan. And in addition to this sum, the funds already released to the TTPS out of its allocation under goods and services, which is subhead 02, to date in fiscal 2021, amount to $222,476,540. Yes. Through you, can I ask the Honorable Minister, which financial institution was used to access this $200 million that you refer to? Minister. I don't want to speak out of turn, Madam President. So I would prefer if the Senator would pose that question in the usual manner, and I would be happy to answer it. Senator Mark. Can I also ask the Honorable Minister whether he's in a position to advise or inform the Senate of the terms and conditions of this said loan, Madam President? I would give the same reply. <laughs> if you pose the question in the normal manner, I would be happy to answer it. Madam Thank President, you. may I ask the Honorable Minister, having regard to this overall allocation through loans and revised allocation,
Can the minister indicate that this matter of debt amassing within the TTPS is now a thing of the past? Can I ask the Honorable Minister through you to guide us on this matter? Minister. Based on discussions with the TTPS, the loan of $200 million should take care of outstanding payments and the additional allocation of $382 million for goods and services in 2021 should be adequate to cover the procurement of goods and services by the TTPS in 2021. However, the TTPS has asked me to make my best effort to ensure that the full amount of the allocation is dispersed in this fiscal year, and I have given that undertaking. Um, can I ask? Yes, yes. one more. Um, can the Honorable Minister indicate, um, as it relates to this loan and its disbursement to the TTPS, is the Minister indicating to this Honorable Senate that the amount, the balance of the 200 million minus the 32 million will be disbursed to the TTPS before or on or before the end of 2021, Madam President. Can I ask that through you? The Minister. basis for this, thank you, Madam President. The basis for disbursements from the loan is the submission of invoices by the TTPS to NIBDEC, who is the executing agency for this matter. And once those invoices are in order, NIBDEC sends a request to the Ministry of Finance, and that is then passed on to the minister who would instruct the bank to disburse the money. The first drawdown of 32 million went well, and I'm therefore hopeful that between now and the end of September, the TTPS will send the necessary invoices, they will check out, and the necessary approvals can be given for the disbursement of the entire 200 million before the end of September, once everybody does what they are supposed to do. I can assure you that I would not spend more than 24 hours when that file appears before me. Sometimes these files are approved by myself, in a couple of minutes, I would not delay because I would be satisfied when I receive it and having checked it, that all concerned have done all of the necessary due diligence that is required. Private members, business motions. Honorable Senators. The debate on the following motion, which was in progress when the Senate adjourned on Tuesday, April the 27th, 2021, will be resumed. Be it resolved that this Senate call on the government to critically assess the deficiencies in the current systems to deal with the incidents of violent crimes against women and girls. And be it further resolved that the government present to the Parliament within three months a legislative agenda and policy implementation plan to more effectively address the rising incidence of violence against women and girls. On the last occasion, those who spoke were Senator Paul Richards, who moved the motion, the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, Senator Lachmidial, Senator Thomas Nye, the Minister of Social Development and Family Services, Senator Gillian John, Senator Vera, Senator Bethelme. Senator Lizawa Lisi. Thank you very much, Madam President. I am really honored to have this opportunity to enter into this discussion as brought forward by Senator Paul Richards. In his motion, which he calls upon the government to critically assess the deficiencies in the current systems to deal with the incidents of violence, crimes against women and girls, and be it further resolved that the government present to the Parliament a legislative agenda and policy, a policy implementation plan to more effectively address the rising incidence of violence against women and girls. Madam President, it is no secret that I hold our independent senators in the absolute highest regard. And Madam, Sen Madam President, I am so tremendously pleased that Senator Paul Richards has used this opportunity 
to hold the door open, to push through this conversation about violence against women and girls using the highest and best platform that he has available to us. Madam President, please permit me to inform this House, this Honourable Senate, that the government is in fact committed to do its part to ensure the protection of our women and our girls. Madam President, in Senator Richards' presentation, which was excellent, I, might, I must add, he spoke to experiences throughout the region. He spoke about everything being a collaborative and cohesive effort um, and that we all must come together. And I applaud him for that, and I'll get to that point very shortly, Madam President. You know, I grew up in Arima. I attended the Arima Girls RC School. My mother was a teacher in my primary school. I was in primary school in the early 90s, uh, and one of my classmates, one of my classmates received devastating news. Her sister, who worked alongside her husband in a Chinese restaurant down the road in Arima, was just murdered by said husband in the Chinese restaurant that all of us as primary school children frequented. Madam President, that was my first real exposure to domestic violence. My classmates, my classmates' niece, the deceased's daughter, was also a student in my primary school, and coincidentally, she was in my mother's class. To this day, almost 30 years later, that young lady is so traumatized about the events of that fateful day in that Chinese restaurant down the road in Arima. She has gone on to become a mother as well. And every slight action agitates her and terrifies her. She herself is a mother, a mother of several children, having become a young mother very early, having lost her own mother at a very, very tender age. And Madam President, that is just one of very many stories that we must acknowledge has happened in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam President, my mother was also a primary school teacher, as I mentioned. My house was 400 meters or one block away from my primary school in Arima. Being a teacher, my mother was not just a teacher to all of her students in the class. She was also counselor to many families. She was protector, she was, a, she was a resident. Several times in our simple home in Arima, that one block away from my primary school and one block away from our church, my family, my siblings and I had to squeeze into one of the bedrooms so that my mother could accommodate another family into one of the bedrooms. And that is a reality for us here in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam President. I do not know that there is anybody in this chamber who has not been affected in one way or another by what we call, uh, by, by what Senator John had referred to as the scourge of domestic violence. But Madam President, you know, um, amidst all of this, amidst all of this, amidst this call for the government to, to do its part to treat with this issue of domestic violence, Madam President. It cannot just be the government to do this. Madam President, the Attorney General will speak to, I presume, uh, all of the, the package of legislation that has passed in this House during his tenure, in, in the Parliament during his tenure, um, as the Attorney General that treats with this matter. But Madam President, there are other things outside of the legislative agenda that must take place for this matter to be treated with. Senator Richard spoke about the involvement of civil society and non-governmental organizations. So with me to declare my interest, I sit on the Council of Girl Guides Association. My husband sits on the Boy Scouts Association. We are actively involved in these two organizations. But Madam President, the interest by the young people is simply not there. 
the Girl Guides has dwindled from probably a membership of about five or 10,000, maybe 15 or 20,000, to probably a membership of under 5,000. And Madam President, what is responsible for that? Have the, pa have the parents, really and truly, of children pushed them or directed them in that direction? So it goes back to the question of, Madam President, what are children learning in their homes? You see, my mother always said to me that your home is your first school, and everything you learn at home is what you will replicate in society. So if at home you learn that daddy hits mommy or daddy interferes with little sister, chances are that there's a high possibility that you will, in fact, do that, Madam President. You know, I was having a chat with my sister the other day, and she was telling me, and we're talking about things that happen in homes, and she was explaining to me that she has some very close friends whose family the tradition is, or the practice is, that the fathers take the virginity of their daughters. And that is a reality here in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam President, how then do we re-engineer the minds of people in this country who partake in these practices, perhaps cultural norms, traditions, I don't know what they are called, how? How do we re-engineer the minds of the people of Trinidad and Tobago to move away from what is clearly a tremendously destructive practice that destroys the family unit, that destroys and steals the innocence of a child, and that destroys a future potential leader or person in this country, Madam President? You know, I am one of my greatest joys in life would be being a mother to three little girls, ages 10, eight, and six. And Madam President, I will do everything in my power to protect my daughters from any threat of any harm, of any violation to their well-being, Madam President. I am fortunate enough to have my children attend a core education primary school. When I was pregnant with my first daughter, my doctor advised me to send the children to a co-ed primary school because it gets children to become a little accustomed to interacting boy-girl and that sort of interaction. He warned against them going to co-ed schools and secondary schools, however, but that's a different conversation altogether. And, and I have seen the great benefit of that, Madam President. Uh, in their school, and which I, I know can be implemented in many schools and is practiced in many schools, there is a very strong anti-bullying and male mentoring program in that primary school. Madam President, we know that all schools ought to have counselors available. Whether the counseling, uh, whether the quantity of counselors is sufficient is a question, but we acknowledge that at least the practice has started. I was speaking with a school counselor last week, and she said to me, she's a counselor in a secondary school, she said to me that her, a young man in, in one of her classes, he's 15 years old, he reached out to her and said, well, miss, I have to drop out of school. And she said, why? And he said, well, miss, my girlfriend, pregnant, the girlfriend is 14, I believe, my girlfriend is pregnant. So both of them now, have taken a decision or, under circumstances, are forced to drop out of school. And Madam President, why is that a norm in Trinidad and Tobago? We've read reports of 2,000 people falling out of the school system through this pandemic. But Madam President, we really have to do better. And by we, I don't mean the government. I mean we as parents and we as invested citizens in Trinidad and Tobago, we have to do better for our children. Madam President, I, um, and I have to say as well, eh, there is no shame whatsoever in seeking counseling. We need to remove, we need to remove all these taboo topics that we can't talk about. We need to remove, uh, we need to remove the curtains and the shadows behind things that affect us. In this pandemic, we have realized that mental health is a very, very real issue. And beyond mental health, psychosocial health, um, 
and help with your family, with somebody to talk to, we've come to realize that that is incredibly important, Madam President. And so I want to let people know there's no shame in seeking counseling. And in Trinidad, we need to remove that taboo of counseling. I also had the privilege of being, uh, of being affiliated with Vision on Mission, which works with the rehabilitation of, of uh, offenders to, present, to prevent recidivism. And Vision on Mission has an incredible program um, in which it seeks to turn around the, mind, the mindset of offenders. And Madam President, it just goes to show that people who are offenders can in fact, when placed in the right situation, can in fact be transformed and therefore all is not lost. We certainly have opportunity to treat with that. Um, the deficiencies in the current system, Madam President, we acknowledge, it has been mentioned here, and the reporting, weaknesses in the follow through, uh, and perhaps cultural practices in this system. And we acknowledge that. But Madam, Madam President, we have all done our part, at least the government has done as best as it can insofar as presenting solutions, Madam President. You would appreciate, Senator Bethelmi would have spoken in depth about the role of the Office of the Prime Minister's Gender and Youth Affairs Department. She would have spoken about uh, the Gender-Based Violence Unit in the TTPS. Minister Cox would have given a thorough analysis of the work of her ministry, so I will not go into those things. But Madam President, what about things like the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service? When the Prime Minister announced that ministry in 2020, in August of 2020, he introduced it with a vision to rewire the minds of the young people in Trinidad and Tobago, because this is going to take a generational change. This is definitely going to take a generational change. In the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, Madam President, there is an expectation that young people will be introduced to civic they'll be introduced to bringing life, breathing life into the national watchwords of discipline, tolerance, and production, Madam President. And so once these things get going, and we have a very energetic and youthful new minister there, we anticipate that we will see certain changes in the behavioral patterns of some young people in this country. Uh, but Madam President, what about other solutions? Civil society really does in fact have a serious role to play. This morning at 4 o'clock, Senator Bethelmi sent a message <laughs> about, uh, about something presented by the Franciscan Institute, and it's called Online Grooming and Sexual Exploitation of Children. Madam President, we've given several, or several previous speakers have given discussions, uh, or rather have given uh, explanations as to what gender-based violence really is, or violence against women really is. But I want to include that online grooming is definitely something that's, that gets to the point of gender-based violence. And so the Franciscan Institute, for instance, is presenting an online session with a clinical child psychologist, and the target audience is forms one to six. And Madam President, this is part of the solution. The solution is, and this debate is part of the solution, the solution really and truly is all of us taking our, uh, taking our energies and harnessing it into something that would be productive to really transform uh, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. You see, Madam President, we could legislate from now until the cows come home. But what we have to do is we have to cause people to really make changes in, in their attitude. They have to change their way of thinking. They have to change their behaviors, Madam President. Uh, but you know, Madam President, it is imperative that we lead by example. When Senator Rambarat was speaking at the last debate, he talked about a class of people or a group of people who may be considered untouchables. And that's a very, very real thing that we have to deal with in this place. Madam President, I am, I am known to frequent carnival events. I enjoy carnival very, very much in Trinidad and Tobago. So, uh, it, just about 2008 or 2009, a group of my girlfriends and 
probably my then fiancé, um, went to QRC Fet. And we were at the front of the stage, and we were having a real good time, very, very safe. And then somebody who was a public, well-known personality is there with his girlfriend and the girlfriend's group of friends. And Madam President, it disgusts me to say what I'm about to say, and I'll be very tempered in how I put it out. This person, this very well-known person, in the, clear, in the public clear at a carnival event, totally out of control, proceeds to take his hand and pass it on the thigh, in between the thigh of his girlfriend and the girlfriend's friend. He also proceeds to pull out her right breast and do whatever he wants with it. And Madam President, why I say these people are untouchable is because he further ascended into high office, really high office, and, you know, sometimes we have cause to, I have cause to interact with him, and it's really just totally unacceptable. Totally unacceptable, Madam President. And these are the types of untouchables that we really, really have to treat with. And why I say it's, it's violence and exploitation is because the girlfriend and the friend were like, no, no, don't touch me, don't touch me. And he was just having his way with them. I don't know if he was influenced by any substance, but Madam President, it was totally unacceptable. And it happened in full view of the public place. So can we imagine, Madam President, what perhaps can happen behind closed doors? Madam President, the, as Senator Richards had pointed out, the woman in Trinidad and Tobago, I think he used a quote from uh, Hillary Clinton, and the women are some of our greatest assets, really and truly. I do believe the women, women are the cradle of civilization. I firmly believe that. It is our duty, Madam President, it is absolutely our duty to look after our women, to look after our children. And this government will not shirk its responsibility. This government will continue to do all in its power, whether it is through legislative moves, whether it is through action, policy action through the ministries, whether it is partnering with NGOs and civil society organizations. But now, Madam President, is the time for all sectors to partner responsibly in a very level-headed manner, and to give women the just respect that is due to them. Uh, Madam President, there are so many other things that this government has undertaken, which we will hear later on in the debate. But I do wish to say that I'm very, very pleased that Senator Richards brought this motion here today. The government continues to be committed and I give the assurance that the members on this side will continue to lead by example through our actions here in the chamber and through our actions outside as public and private citizens. Thank you very much, Madam President. Senator Dylan Remy. Madam President, I thank you for the opportunity to join in this debate this afternoon. I thank Senator Lizama Lee Singh for her very moving presentation just now. She actually almost brought me to tears. I'm thankful for the opportunity to make this brief contribution on Senator Paul Richards' private member's motion regarding the deficiencies in the current systems to deal with incidents of violent crimes against women and girls, which has been such a matter of great concern for all of us in Trinidad and Tobago for some time now. 
and I commend all the senators who have gone before in this debate making excellent contributions so far. Senator Richards asks us to debate in this motion, be it resolved, that the Senate calls on the government to criti critically assess the deficiencies in the current systems, to deal with the incidents of violence, crime against women and girls, and be it further resolved that the government presents to the parliament within three months a legislative agenda and policy implementation plan to more effectively address the rising incidents of violence against women and girls. So it's in two parts, critically assess the deficiencies in the current systems and also present to the Senate a legislative agenda and policy implementation plans. Madam President, far too often, we tend to deal with the symptoms of what is going on. Many times we don't dig deep to what the root causes are, and we just tend to respond. So, um, violence against women and girls, we march, we this, we put things down, and then we say, okay, put a little plaster on the saw here, and feel comfortable about it for a while. The plaster on the saw could be legislative, the plaster on the saw could be improving prison sentences or some such thing which I consider you just dealing with the symptoms. But what this calls for, and again I said I commend or a colleague, Pres um, Senator Richards, it calls for, and I think all the, pres all the pro presenters have so far have gone into what are we dealing with in terms of root cause so that we deal with the root cause of what the issues are so that we can find lasting solutions. The World Health Organization in an article on their website dated March 9, 2021, talks about devastatingly pervasive, one in three women globally experience violence that violence against women, particularly intimate part of violence and sexual violence, and they called it a major public health problem and a violation of women's human's right, human rights. The estimate published by the WHO indicate that globally, about 30% of women worldwide have been subjected to either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. And it further stated that most of this violence is intimate partner violence and worldwide some 27% of women aged 14, 15 to 49 years who have been in a relationship report that they have been subject to some form of physical and sexual violence by their intimate partner. So the issue of violence against women and girls is not only an issue that, that, is, that we are dealing with here in Trinidad and Tobago, it's an issue that is worldwide. However, we have to find our own solutions because our causes may be very different. In an article on globalvoices.org, February 28th, 2021, written by Jada Stewart and Janine Mendes Franco, they highlighted the day by day, year after year, women in Trinidad and Tobago are under attack. And they talked about Dana Sita Hall, they talked about Marcia Henville, et cetera. And they, we can talk about those things again and again and again. By the close of 2016, there was mentioned the 20-year-old bank employee went missing, found later in a storeroom in a variety store at Port of Spain. At the end of 2020, the Express newspaper dated 24th December 2020 by Kim Budram. The article stated that 46 women were killed, 21 of them in domestic violence situations, representing around 13% of homicides for the year. The article further went on to state that in Trinidad and Tobago, the police service reported that of 745 people reported missing for 2020, 416 were women and girls. Reflecting on 2020, the Coalition of Domestic Violence, said, Co Coalition for Domestic Viol Against Domestic Violence, said that in the year 
when the Domestic Violence Act was strengthened and the police established gender-based violence unit, 21 women were killed as a result of domestic violence and other sexually assaulted and murdered by people within their own families, social circles, and strangers. An article dated March the 14, 2021 in the Newsday by Clint Chantak, our Attorney General, Honorable Faris Alwari, said that government was coming with more than just pepper spray legislation to combat crime in Trinidad and Tobago. He was talking about the suite of legislation that the government was bill, bill bringing to deal with incidents of violence. This was in reference, the article said, this was in reference to very far-reaching laws that I intend to bring to Parliament, says Honorable Faris Alwari. He said, these include additional amendments to the Sexual Offenses Act, Evidence Act concerning witness anonymity evidence, Trafficking in Persons Act, Computer Misuse Act. Then he stated, we intend to return with whistleblowing legislation. We intend to list from cybercrime package that we had into the Sexual Offenses Act to criminalize things like breach of confidence of intimate partners, where one partner leaks images of another partner, etc., etc. Madam President, we know that the Attorney General has been very um, resolute in terms of whatever has to be done in terms of the, um, dealing with the law and putting things in place. But as everyone has so far said, the law is one part of this problem. Fixing the law is only one part of the problem. And as Senator Lizama Leasing just talked about, and many of the um, um, persons who would have presented before talked about this has to be a holistic involvement of all society dealing with the issues that we are facing. We know that since the Attorney General have spoken that time, in, on May the 18th in the Senate, the, fireman, the Firearms Amendment Bill 2021 was passed, bringing to legal use, the u legal use of pep pepper spray for women. And the bill was passed in the House of Parliament on June the 16th, and is currently waiting assent by the President. There's enough evidence, Madam President, that we do have a grave problem facing our beautiful Twin Island Republic. And we see that there have been many efforts that have been put in place, putting in place some measures to deal with the issues, particularly in recent times, putting legislation together. And while I applaud these initiatives, Madam President, may I also add some recommendations made by the World Health Organization. In 2019, the WHO and the UN Women, with endorsement from 12 other UN and bilateral agencies, published an implementation package for preventing violence against women. This package provides a framework for preventing and ending violence against women, and it is aimed at policy makers. It's entitled RESPECT, the acronym R-E-S-P-C-T, and each letter of the acronym stands for one of seven strategies that is recommended for dealing with prevention of violence against women and children. The R deals with relationship skills strengthening. And every, again, many people have spoken about these things starting in families and starting early, because this is where children learn a lot of their behaviors. Building relationships in families, teaching children to respect from the, in, in, in the families, how to respect other, each other. As we know, children learn what they see. And in many cases, what they see at home is what they do. Again, Senator Lizama Lee Singh just spoke about what is going on in what she has seen and experienced in, in, in different families. We know that the availability of healthy relationship counseling for persons who are having difficulty within relationships within the family is key 
to people dealing with their issues and things not resulting in, the, in um, going out into violence. So relationship skills strengthening is, what is one of the areas that is mentioned in this article, and R deals with the R of the respect. Senator Thompson, uh, he in her presentation made a strong plea also for confronting these issues in relation to families. And so did Senator Vieira in his contribution. Madam President, the E talks about empowerment of women and girls, empowering them to know their strengths, empowering them to know and have strong self-esteem to be able to stand up for themselves and stand up for their rights. Knowing who they are and being able to stand in the face of extreme difficult situations, but it is possible to do so. The S in the acronym stands for services, providing important services, services reporting, services for counseling, we talked about um, counseling, relationship counseling, specifically being, and, and this is something that we know it um, doesn't happen a lot where particularly men do not, many of them don't think they need counseling in situations where they're dealing with their own re, um, feelings and anger and stuff like that. But men talking to men, I know there are many um, organizations that are having um, op opportunities now where they are helping men to talk about their issues, dealing with, um, again, dealing with counseling for men. So S stands for services. The P in respect stands for reduction of poverty. As we know, there are many women that stay in relationships because they think that that's where they, 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 can, they, they have to be because they, that's where the finances are being um, provided for the um, nurturing of the, of the family, and as a result, they stay in poverty situations causing in, in detriment to themselves. So the P stands for poverty reduction. The E stands for enabling environments, providing enabled environments, like in workplaces, in public spaces, etc. I think Senator, um, Senator Lizama Leasing just spoke about an incident there in an environment that certainly was not enabling, probably needed um, <clears throat> action that probably could not, would, would have probably resulted in, 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 in the same violence that we are talking about. If people had, if the persons had retaliated in the way that was probably required in a situation where you were openly being humiliated in the public. So that is not the kind of environment we are talking about. We are talking about providing enabling environments where the environment is, um, people are taught, and, 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 and uh, women, men, children, people are respected. The kind of en enabling environment that provides a respect for persons at schools and workplaces, etc. The C in the acronym st stands for Child and Added Adolescent Abuse Prevention Programs for the Prevention of Abuse to Children and Adolescents. And the T stands for Transform Attitudes, Beliefs, and Norms. And uh, um, Senator Richards in his presentation, Senator Thompson, uh, he, and just again, Senator, Senator Leasing, Lizam Leasing, talked about the types of norms that we consider appropriate in our environment that have to be changed if these issues about um, women's violence against women and girls have to be changed. Transformed attitudes and beliefs. Madam President, I do endorse the strategies that the WHO recommended in their, in their, in their statement. Since real changes will have to occur and it has to occur over a period of time, it's not going to change overnight, and it's not going to be changed with just legislation. It has to be changed over, and it has to be strategic in terms of what is done at different stages of our, of our, um, of our lifetime. Madam President, I do support this motion, especially understanding that, one, it requires a multidisciplinary approach, again mentioned by many other speakers before, and 
I also agree that we must put in place emphasis on programs that deal with prevention that rather, rather than just waiting on the violence to occur. We could ensure that as a nation, we condemn violence against persons, period, and that includes violence against women and girls. Madam President, I would end with this story. It's a story from the Public Broadcasting Service, PBS News of the United States of America, dated May 18, 2021, entitled, Brutal Violence Against Women in Trinidad and Tobago Ignored by Government, Critics Say. That's the title. The story was written by Malcolm Brabant, and it paid in Trinidad and Tobago in a not so pleasant light stating that if violence wins, our twin island risks being deemed as a paradise lost. I have no doubt that we are not a paradise lost, because I am an eternal optimist. I do have optimism in our people to do what is right. It may not look like that right now, but I do have that. Um, I don't have that. I, don't have, I do have that optimism in our people. So therefore, I am urging us all to do all that we can to deal with our significant social issues of which Senator Richards has put an important motion on the table for debate. I do look forward to the response of the government in bringing forward a comprehensive response. Madam President, I am here and I'm a part of this republic and a part of this legislature and I'm here to do my part in whatever has to be done. I thank you. Senator Rambachan. Thank you, President. Good afternoon to the members of the Honorable Chamber. Critically assess the deficiencies in the current systems to deal with the incidents of violence against women and girls. Like my friend Senator Lizama, I applaud Senator Richards for bringing this motion. And I'm struck by the irony that it took a man to stand up and say, what are we doing about women's rights for everybody to sit up and listen? That in and of itself is a deficiency in the system. Because it means, members of this honorable house, that some women do not think they have a voice. And maybe that's a deficiency we need to cure. Some girls do not have avenue and options. Maybe that is an avenue or an option or a deficiency we need to cure. I am sure every single member of this house can stand and speak with anecdotal reference to a story somewhere of someone who has suffered. And it is not a nice thing to say domestic violence gender-based violence, violence against children, that those things happen so commonly that everybody knows it. But nobody speaks of it because it remains taboo in 2021. Why? Is there a deficiency in our system that does not encourage persons to speak up? These are questions I would want to answer in my presentation. Now, I too want to use a story, a real story, a story when I prosecuted, and I know Senator Lachmidial will know this case that I'm going to use. And many of you might remember it because it was in the media, where a man who was separated from his wife went into a maxi taxi stand where she was waiting for a maxi. She was seated in that maxi. He entered that maxi, drew a knife, and stabbed her, dragging her out of that maxi into the full glare of, of, of the public and finished what he intended to do, resulting in him getting charged for murder. Why do I want to use that example? Because I'm sure it causes many of you to recoil because that example shows us the deficiencies of the system that currently exist. 
And I agree with Senator Richards. It is not about the blame game. Every single person in society is responsible for the society that they are a part of. What is the relevance of that story? Well, she was a victim of domestic violence for very many years, and she had made several reports. So why did it escalate into her death? Was there a deficiency in the investigative process? Did the police treat her report with the sensitivity and the urgency it required? The age-old question we all ask when we deal with violence against women, could it have been prevented? Well, perhaps if we look at the deficiencies at this point, we can start fixing it. Because if the police have the tools and resources that they need to properly police domestic violence cases, gender-based violence, those things that affect women and girls, perhaps we can make a dent in the cyclical devastation of women's rights in this country. Because the unfortunate thing is, the majority of police officers are men, and they have entrenched in them built-in prejudice that affects their investigative abilities. I'm sure many of you here would have heard stories of women going to the police station and asking for assistance and being told, oh God has just a lover's quarrel, go home and make up. Go and make two roti for him and everything will be good. That was a real response I got from a client. They told her, go home and make two roti and curry a chicken and everything will be good. And yes, we look at these situations and we say to ourselves, it can't be happening in 2021. But the sad reality is that it is. So this young lady in the maxi taxi, could she have been saved if the police was more proactive? Yes. Could the young man have found himself in the arms of the state? And when I say that, I mean in jail which might have caused him to sit and consider the potential repercussions of his actions to prevent him from taking her life. Could that have been done? Yes. Could there have been some program to assist him to deal with his anger issues? Perhaps. Could there have been a program to assist the young lady in understanding her value and worth so that she would walk away from the situation? Perhaps. Why did he think it was necessary to go there and kill her? That's the second deficiency I want to highlight in the existing system. Toxic masculinity. Do we have things in place in the current system to assist men who are rapidly losing their identity? And when I say their identity, I don't mean their name. I mean their purpose. I mean the manner by which they define their manhood. You will hear everybody say a man is a provider and a protector. If his ability to provide is removed, he becomes frustrated. His inability to, to present himself in the manner in which he thinks he presents frustrates him. And what happens? Some of these men without the ability to channel that rage, anger, or frustration, they take it out on their partner. They take it out on their children. What policies do we have for men who feel they need help? That's the deficiency. How do we treat with toxic masculinity in the TTPS when we all hear stories that when the women go to make a report, the ability of the officer to investigate is directly equivalent to her ability to give her number, if you understand what I'm saying. That cannot be right. It cannot be that we have no programs available for the abuser. 
Because domestic violence, we all know it. I do not need to spout all of the rhetoric and the cliches. Yes, it's a cycle. The abuser, he, the abused becomes the abuser. Well, what do we do to stop that cycle? What, what programs do we have for men who might be willing to say, I have a problem and I want it fixed? Perhaps that is a deficiency that the government can correct. Perhaps there can be some movement towards education, opportunity, possibility that may turn these men away from looking at their partner as a punching bag and instead look at themselves in the mirror and see how they can improve. Now, violence against women, everybody always focus on men. But there is violence against women from other women, mothers who beat their daughters because they're talking to a boy, grandmothers who have an outdated and archaic way of raising children who, do, who would not understand the role of social media. How do they monitor Instagram and Facebook when we, they themselves don't know what it is? Are we providing the tools to the persons who are taking care of our children so that they can deal with situations like this? When a child is abused or a victim of crime, what options are there for that child beyond counseling provided by the court? What avenue of learning do we have for them so that they can learn a skill beyond what, that, beyond what they have? So one of the deficiencies perhaps illustrated by my example is the man in the story. What do we have in place to fix him? Nothing. Then we have that she was going to this maxi and I'm sure a lot of people will say, well, why didn't she change her route? Why was she on the maxi taxi stand if she knew he would find her? Simple. She had no other option. That is another deficiency in the system. There are no placement options available for long-term rehabilitation of victims of crime, especially women and children. And right now, to place a woman with her children in a shelter is extremely difficult. And I'm not saying that because of where I stand. I say that because of where I worked. I was the manager of legal services at the Children's Authority. And on very many occasions, the court was stumped. The attorneys were stumped because there simply was nowhere to put them. Where is it now? My friend, Senator Lazama, and I smile when I say this because she has been very kind to me in my um, temporary appointment. And when I say kind, she smiles at me and I smile back. <laughs> All right, Senator Lazama said, that the Office of the Prime Minister, Ministry of Gender, they have provided all of the solutions available. And we could legislate, it, we could legislate from now till the cows come home, but we have to change the way of thinking. I agree, we need to change the way of thinking. But I want to say this, the cows have come home. It is time to think beyond the box that we have already traditionally exhausted. Yes, they could send them for counseling. Yes, we could have our gender-based violence unit. Yes, we can have programs available. But are we really doing it with a purpose and a focused intent in mind? And that is why I applaud the second part of Senator Richard's private motion, which is to provide policy, a legislative plan, I have always said that we need to be less reactive. We need to be proactive when it comes to things like violence against women and children. We need to have a realistic look at what exists and see how it needs to be improved. Sometimes we in positions of power have this disease 
of defensiveness. From the time you are criticized, you defend your position. That is not helpful because it means that you are not seeing the reality of what is wrong, so you cannot fix it. So when I say to you that there is nothing available to the abuser to change the cycle of abuse, there is nothing available to treat with the woman or the victim of the offense because there are no placement options. There is nothing in place for behavioral modification for those who offend. Because violence against women is not just hitting, you know. It is emotional and psychological. And what we seem to lose sight of, honorable members, is that the women who are victims today give birth to the victims of tomorrow. So how do we stop that? We stop that by being honest with ourselves. We stop that by saying we understand that the police in the investigative process needs a cultural shift. We understand that those of us who have a voice, when we speak, we must speak carefully and send the right message. You cannot tell me, honorable members across, that you will say that the government is serious and committed, but there does not exist a Ministry of Gender and Child Affairs. It is a division of the office of the Prime Minister. Should it not be a standalone agency to deal with this problem that we are calling the scourge of the nation? Perhaps that may be a deficiency the honorable members may want to consider. Whether or not it sends the right message that we are merely a division rather than a full ministry. Could it be then that if we put focus on women and girls and the need for change, real and dramatic fulfilling change, if we show that our focus is there, the possibility of improvement is higher? Does it not send the right message that we are dealing with something that needs to be dealt with? And it is not that we are responding to the members of the public when they march? The other deficiency illustrated by my story is the length of time the matter took to get to trial for him to be convicted. More than seven years. So the family of the victim had to wait seven years to go through the trial process. And then he pleaded guilty to manslaughter, which he has the legal right to do. But the problem is it took seven years. So if it took seven years to get to trial, and she had made several reports before, before she was killed, in totality, that young lady's legacy, her life legacy, was measured more by the offense committed against her than the opportunity she may have had to enjoy. That is the reality of the system that we exist in today. Right now, domestic violence shelters, many of the victims who go there, I've already said there's a difficulty with children. Many of them who go there, they find themselves there for a very short period of time, and they call it a prison. They feel imprisoned. And the imprisonment comes from the fact that they are afraid to go out there and see the perpetrator. So they confine themselves to where they're at. But when they are confined there, after three months, they must leave. Where does that place them? Not in the home of the abuser again? A child who makes a report of sexual abuse against a family member who lives in the home, what option do you have for placement of that child? None. So she is back in the home with the abuser. All of these are deficiencies. And it is not a criticism. It is a realistic look at where we have come because we have not dealt with this matter in strong terms when it needed to be dealt with. And I'm not talking my generation. I'm talking about the generation before me and even before them. 
Because domestic violence, gender-based violence, violence on the whole is taught behavior. So perhaps we should look at where the children are learning and how we can fix. Because the children are going to be the ones to come tomorrow and perhaps be either the victim or the perpetrator. Do we have transition homes for children? Under the Children's Authority Act, you are supposed to have transition homes. And you know what transition homes are? You have children in the system. When they reach the age 15 to 18, they're supposed to move into the transition home where they're going to learn a skill, how to take care of themselves, and then they're released into the world as an upstanding member of society who can contribute. We don't have that. So no transition homes, that's another deficiency. So what happens is a child, a girl child, who is in the system, who may have been placed at St. Jude's, because the old terminology is the child is beyond control, meaning the parent is unable to control the child. So they make an application before the court and the child is placed at St. Jude's. That system has now changed where you say the child is a child in need of supervision. And I applaud these changes that have happened incrementally over time because it is a step in the right direction. The question is, is it enough? Is the problem bigger than the solution we are presenting now? Yes, it is. So that child at 18 is put out of the state housing facility they are at, whether it is a, a children's home or an a organization like St. Jude's, and she's put on the street. Who is she going to turn to? She becomes the prime target of a predator. And then three, four years later, she may very well have been that woman in the maxi taxi. So we need to understand the overarching responsibility all state agencies have when it comes to violence against women. But I want to wrap up my presentation in a sort of odd way. The conversation about violence against women and girls is always focused on the offender. Why men do what they do? Toxic masculinity, behavioral modification. Why do men feel that they own and control women? Why do they have the sense of possessiveness? Cultural shift, education, all of these are things targeted to the perpetrator. Why is not more effort targeted to the victim? So I want to speak to the victim now. I want to speak to women. And I want to say this to you. And this is where I would want to agree with Senator Lazama when she said, it cannot just be the government to deal with it. No, it's not just the government alone. It is us every single person. And to the women who might be in situations where they are uncomfortable, or they might find themselves without a voice, you are the creator of your change. Your voice needs to be heard. And there are very many who would say, well, I don't have an education. I didn't finish school because I dropped out because I got pregnant at 14. Senator Lizama said that, an example she gave. Okay, do you have other programs available to you? I want to talk about my mother. That's why I said I want to finish differently and give you a little snapshot of my life. My mother stopped school at 12 to take care of my aunt. 
And my mother, despite her lack of education, is one of the most enterprising women I have ever met. And if I am but one-fifth the woman she is, I will have done well. Because without education, she has raised a family. And I have seen her relationship with my father and the, the equal voice they both have in their marriage. And I have learned at my 41 years of age that what they represent is actually the exception, not the rule. And the reason they were able to work and get me to where I stand today, temporarily, though it may be, I'm grateful for it. Even though they did not have my father as well. My father never went to school. My father is a cane cutter. Literally, I am the daughter of a cane cutter from Karenin. But the fact that they had limitations out there didn't stop them in here. And they have built a legacy that I'm proud to be a part of. And I want to say to women who are the victims of violence that you, in equal measure, your voice needs to be heard. And when you start to speak up and you show the deficiencies in the system, as has been done in the last few months, change will happen. Your voice will be heard. As women, we are the targets of not the best terms, and sometimes it breaks us down. And my approach to it might be different to everybody else's. Somebody might look at me and say, well, you're fat. And I'll say, yes, I am. Thank you. They might say, you dress oddly. And I say, I do. But that does not affect the quality of my character and the words that come out of my mouth. Senator Ramachan, you have five more minutes. I am grateful, please, Madam President. The reason I say this is so that those out there will understand that you can be the person to effect the change you need. Yes, it is frightening. Yes, you don't know what options you might have. But now is the time because people are listening. There has never been a time where society is so ready to effect change when it comes to women and girls. So now is the time to make your voice heard. Now is the time to stand up for yourself. Now is the time to know your worth. My mother always says, you can't be anything to anybody if you're nothing to yourself. And some women will say they stay in the relationship because of their children. And I want to ask them this. How can you protect your child if you cannot protect yourself? So while we may focus on the offender, I want to respectfully suggest that even more focus must be paid on the victim, the girls who are aging out and have nowhere to go and become prime fodder for predators, the women who do not have financial opportunity or skills Give them that. Give them the ability to financially support themselves. Create programs. Create placement options. If there is a targeted approach with clear goals laid out and legislation that conforms with those goals and state agencies are given the resources that they need, we can make a dent. We've started too. I am excited to see what I see. The Gender-Based Violence Unit has done excellent work in the TTPS. They have changed the conversation, and the conversation needs to continue. So I want to end by thanking the honorable members for their time, Senator Richards for placing the motion there. I may have been a little bit more passionate than I intended to be, but that is how strongly I feel about it. Because I believe 
every woman's voice should be heard. That is why we all, we all ascribe to the statement, I am woman, hear me roar. Yeah. So for those of you who are in that situation, roar. It's time for your voice to be heard. Madam President, I thank you. Senator De Freitas. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to weigh in and have my voice heard on this topic that is engaging this honorable chamber today, which Senator Richards has raised by way of his motion, which speaks to, in a nutshell, the issue of violence against women or gender-based violence. And Madam President, the issue that Senator Richards has so timely raised, in my opinion, is magnanimous in nature, colossal in its effect on human societies, global in nature, with our very own local brand of manifestation. Senator Richards has outlined nothing but facts in his contribution. This issue requires a all-hands-on-deck approach. He alluded to a bipartisan approach, but I will go further to say that the approach that needs to be taken is a non-partisan one. Bipartisan tends to suggest that each side holds to their policy and they work together. This particular issue is non-partisan. There can be no politics whatsoever involved at all in this because this is an issue that would transcend governments, governments of the same party, governments of different parties. It is something that every single person needs to buy into. And I think based on what I've heard here today from all sides, everybody can agree with me that there is buy-in and something needs to be done. Madam President, the statement in Senator Richard's contribution that stuck with me was the one where he indicate, indicated sorry, that we all need to work together by way of institutions. And I would just go on to say this. I agree with you, Senator Richards. You're right, in the sense that all of these institutions do need to work together. But then as I thought about it after the last time everyone contributed on this, I started to wonder if that was the issue, that all institutions need to work together. Yes, it needs to happen, but if that is something that is difficult to happen, then maybe that is the issue. You see, Madam President, in my mind, because of the nature of this problem, and because this particular problem is one that runs deep in terms of culture, in terms of it's how deeply it runs in society in terms of, as I've heard Senator Rambajan and several other speakers on the last occasion mention, deep within the mindset and psyche of individuals in a society. And because it runs so deep, it is something that if it is that you're going to solve, then you have to go all of the way back. You have to get through all of the several layers. And a lot of the solutions that I've been hearing put forward by all sides, great solutions, they peel back one layer based on this particular institution, another layer based on another institution, but they do not go as deeply as it should, and I will go deeper into that. And let me just give an example. Every time I hear about gender-based violence, one of the first things that creeps in is men versus women. And I understand that because the statistics will all show, obviously, it's men causing harm towards women. So I get that. But when I speak about going deeper, and when you get down to those deeper layers in terms of the psyche and the mindset, in terms of getting between the layers of the culture and society, you would understand that you cannot just lay blame at the feet of men and say, well, men have to do this and men have to do that. 
because it's men against women, and that's what the statistics show. And I'll give you an example. So Senator Ramajan, when she got up and made her contribution, immediately stated that something was wrong because Senator Richard, being a man, got up and raised the issue. Well, I'll respond to say something is wrong with even thinking of it that way. Anybody should get up and raise this issue. If it's an all hands on deck approach, man or woman should raise this issue because they all have to work together in order to solve this issue. So it shouldn't be that a woman is the one to get up and raise this issue and champion this issue. Let it be championed by anybody who doesn't want to see violence against women moving forward, period. So I'm very glad Senator Richards is the one to raise it in this particular forum, in this particular legislature. And if you look outside into society, you will see other women's groups been championing this particular issue for the longest while. But we really have to get to the crux of the matter and change that mindset and not say, well, because it's an issue for women, that a woman should be the one to raise that particular issue in this particular forum. Madam President, Senator Richards indicated in his contribution and several other speakers that have gone in the last day and here today have spoken to several institutions having a role to play. And those institutions would be the legislature, the judiciary, the TTPS, transportation and education, just to name a few. So we've heard speakers, and Senator Laurel Lizama Leasing spoke to it. I'm sure the AG will speak to it, and Senator Bacchus, the minister in public administration and digitization will speak to it in relation to their particular portfolios. But we've heard of several pieces of legislation being passed in relation to being able to protect women. And it is not that they're taking long to be passed, because you would remember on April 27th, Senator Richards, in his contribution, would have spoken to the pepper spray legislation, which was imminent. And you would notice that that particular piece of legislation has been passed. Further to that, the Sexual Offenses Amendment Bill, again, spoken to when he moved the motion on April 27th, again has been passed. So there is commitment to pass the necessary legislation to bring some level of relief or solution to the issue from the standpoint of the legislature. But the legislature is just where it begins. It needs to trickle down into all of the various institutions to be executed in order to begin to attack the problem from that layer. And so, if you look at the judiciary, it is Senator Lachmidial and her contribution that spoke in great deal and in great length in relation to the judiciary and the problems. And obviously, she was raising the issue of efficiency and how fast cases are disposed of, especially as it relates to domestic violence and gender-based violence. She went on to make a suggestion that the courts could set up a special victims unit, so to speak, in relation to gender-based violence so that they could be treated with properly and efficiently. And that's a very good suggestion, and I will leave it to the Attorney General, if he speaks later, to truly respond to that and the ability to do something like that. And of course, the response that you would have heard in relation to the efficiency of disposal of cases, you would have known in the 11th Parliament that a lot of legislation passed through this very chamber in relation to allowing the courts to be able to move faster in the way they dispose of those cases. But what I would say, Madam President, is that as much as that idea is good, you have to really think of it from the standpoint of, like I said, ensuring that the mindset of the individuals that populate those institutions is corrected. And that's why I said in the beginning, a few minutes ago, you have to go deeper. And as I go through these institutions and go through the layers, when I get to the last one, I will show you exactly where we need to go. Because the problem is this, and Senator Dylan Remy spoke to it, and Senator Rambajan spoke to it and touched on it a little bit. If it is you don't start at the very beginning, and these individuals, these children that we are raising, if they are raised in a particular environment where certain things are the norm, then they're eventually going to go into society and populate these very same institutions, causing the problems that Senator Rambajan raised in relation to not being able to properly address things like gender-based violence 
in these institutions and the efficiency that needs to take place in terms of addressing that particular issue. Madam President, we move on to the TTPS. Now, Senator Ramajan spoke about the TTPS and indicated that the problem was the male police officers. Again, this is why I said you cannot just go down one road and lay it all at the feet of men alone. And this is not in any kind of way to defend men per se, but I just want to prove this point. Senator Lachmedial, on the last occasion, in her contribution, gave a story, Senator Rambajan. And as much as the TTPS, because we've heard those stories where women would go into the police station and they would not either have the reports dismissed or the reports would not be taken or they'd be told, yes, you could go back home and make up with your husband or, or whoever is the common law partner that you have there. And so when the TTPS responded and indicated that they'd be setting up a gender-based unit, I said to myself, okay, well, that's good. Now, in that gender-based unit, it's a start. You can populate that unit with women who would tend to be more sensitive to the various issues, especially if a woman comes into the police station and makes a report. Because as a woman, they would have been going through some of you know, the experiences that many of our debaters in here today have indicated they have a friend who've gone through, and therefore will be some level of sensitivity. So imagine my shock when Senator Lachmedial tells the story of the 18-year-old girl that walks into the police station, makes a report to a female officer, who then went on leave, had the file home, the case is being called in the courts, nobody's showing up, and if it wasn't for her intervention, the case would have been dismissed. So, Senator Rambajan, my response to you, by saying that it's male police officers, your own colleague just indicated it's not just male officers. Obviously, the problem is wider than that. Because you're thinking in your head, woman to woman, woman to protect woman, woman sensitive to women's plight. But here's a story that when an 18-year-old woman tries to make a file or report to another woman, the same problem happens. And that's why I keep saying it, and you'll hear me repeating it over and over again, the entirety of the mindset needs to be addressed. If it is that you're going down the road of saying, well, let's tackle it from the male standpoint, then you're going to miss out a whole other section. And the problem will never be resolved doing that alone. Now, Madam President, in relation to what I just indicated with the TTPS, let me just go on to say too that that particular problem probably could have been solved with proper procedure. Now, when I heard that story, a couple of things jumped out at me. The first one is that I didn't know police officers could take case files home. I, I, I didn't know that. The second one is that if an officer responsible for a case goes on leave, isn't the case passed off to another officer for continuance? The third one is, why didn't the female officer follow up even after returning from leave? And as I indicated, you know, because as a female, you want to ensure that woman to woman, women are protecting women. And let me just say, Senator Richards, as much as you've called in this particular motion for some sort of government intervention, I would go as far as to just say this, and Senator Bacchus, the Minister in Public Administration and Digitization, will probably speak more to this. I don't want to preempt him. But it's my hope that digitization would solve a lot of these process issues. Let me just call it that. 
Because that is what we hope that digitization will be able to do. That you don't have a situation like this being repeated, I hope not, because this is just one instance that Senator Lachmidial spoke to. That if a case is being reported, Senator Rambajan, that once a woman walks into a police station and they file a report that there's a paper trail of such digitally, that the commissioner of police, when next he appears before the Joint Select Committee on National Security, Senator Richards, of which you and I both serve on, that we can then speak to him and ask him pertinent questions in relation to data, how many reports have been filed in relation to gender-based violence, how many have been followed up on, how many have been dismissed? No longer would you walk into a police station and be turned away, Senator Rambajan, because that victim can then stand in that police station and say, no, I want a report made. Because I will tell you now, all of the stories that we're hearing, if you could hear it and I could hear it and everybody in this chamber could hear it, understand that the victims are also hearing it. And in so hearing it, they are telling themselves, well, I'm not going to go to the police station because they're going to send me home to make two roti. And that is how digitization and fixing those small processes could help. Because if I know as a victim that once I cross that police door, that is a digital footprint of the report that I am making and somebody is forced to follow up. Because now there's a, you can measure what is taking place. So I just wanted to put that on there and of course, I leave it to the minister with the responsibility with digitization to go further in relation to that. So Madam President, I ask the question. In relation to the best way to solve this problem, and I'm going to say it because Senator Richards hit the nail on the head coming down to the end of his contribution. Education, education, education. He spoke to programs in other countries dealing with gender-based violence that they would start at the high school level and once they did that, they actually went on to the primary school level. I think it was in one of the Caribbean countries you indicated it was Bahamas or something to that effect. And they were having great results in relation to the reduction of gender-based violence because you started the training at that level. Now, let me tell you why I indicated mindset is what we need to target. By giving you a story. Several years ago, now the world has gone through several different crises, I would call it. You have the pandemic now, you have economic downturns. But several years ago, when I was much younger, there was a tsunami in one of the Asian countries. And I distinctly remember looking at the television, the news. And this was after everything had subsided, obviously. It's time to rebuild. And the individuals coming out of their houses to assess the damage all started to, one by one, clean up their respective areas. And what struck me and stuck in my memory was the newscaster indicating that once one individual was done with theirs, they immediately began to go to their neighbor and help the neighbor. And what the newscaster said at the point in time was that they were amazed at the fact that there was no looting, no rioting, no type of chaos whatsoever. What struck them was the orderly fashion in which this particular process started to happen. I said, okay. But then it wasn't too long after that I ended up reading an article and in those same Asian countries, what the article indicated was that the school process, the education process for their children, for the first three years, they learn nothing. No math, no English, no language. The first thing they learn, manners, how to treat each other, 
respect for each other. That's the first three years. Nothing else. They learn to clean up after themselves. And what the article ended by saying is that before you put on top of anything else, the mathematics, the language, the sciences, you lay down the values of the society. Knowing fully well that when they age and they go out into the society, it is those values that lay the deepest in their psyche. And when you listen to that, and you juxtapose it to what occurred in that crisis, you understand how effective that was. And that's what I mean by we have to get to the crux of the matter by going as deeply as you can into the mindset. So as much, Senator Richard, that you want to see at that level. And as they start to grow and move through the school system, you start to add on the other layers that you want. So you start to teach them about good relationships, similar to what has been done that Senator Richard spoke to. You start to teach them about sex education, if that's the way you want to go. You start to teach them about a little bit more complicated societal issues in relation to relationships as they get older and as their mind develops and they can understand it. So that when they turn 18 and enter into the society, they then become the change agents that you want to see for what Senator Rambajan, Senator Dylan Remy, and Senator Richards and everybody Richards and everybody else that has spoken about is bad. They are now the ones that will go there and take that layer, that base layer that was laid down in infant one into the society. So that by the time all of us inside here are too old and only care about how fast the rocking chair does rock, that we would start to see those changes because those babies would now be leading the charge. They will now be in the TTPS. They will now be in the judiciary. They will now be in the legislature. And you don't have to ask what's going on in those institutions. Because of what they learned in Infant One, they know that when the victim walks into the police station, this has to be taken seriously. And I'm going to take the report, and I'm going to follow up. And when the investigation begins, that police officer is going to take it all the way through. And when it hits the court, the court is going to take it seriously. And ensure that the case follows all the way through. That is how you make the change. That is the only way to make the consistent kind of change that is required to ensure that this particular problem is dealt with once and for all. Now do you understand why I say it's a mindset issue? One of the hardest issues for any human society to treat with. Anybody would know that behavior is one of the hardest things to change, either for yourself or in others. And you have to start from young to inculcate and plant the seeds of the values that you want. So Madam President, Senator Richards, you understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't do the things that we're doing now. Do them. Because it will help address the issues. We'll speed up the cases in the judiciary. We'll talk to the TTPS by way of the Joint Select Committee of National Security and ensure that the processes are put in place. We will look at the education system and try to deal with it from that standpoint as well and put in the programs. And let me just, before I move on, respond to Senator Rambajan, because she indicated that some of the programs weren't there in relation to victims Senator and whatnot. Senator Defritas, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Madam President. And Senator Rambajan, let me just respond by indicating that there are programs and there is help for the children and for victims. There are shelters that are up and running, because I think she indicated and she was asking, I don't think you were saying that the shelters weren't there at all, but you were asking whether the shelters were up and running. 
But I'm just responding to that to indicate that shelters are up and running and there is, for victims, the ability to go to these shelters and there is wraparound service for the victims and so there is help that is happening now and available now. So it's not that those particular programs aren't there for them, but what I'm saying, Senator Rambajan, is that it can't be that. That deals with after the fact. We want to treat with it before the fact. But it's not right to really say that those programs are not there. They're there and they're available to victims. Um, the shelters take boys and girls and the women can stay until they can be independent or reintegrated with their family. So these capabilities are there and it's not that the shelters aren't running. Um, and I just want to put that out there too because obviously, like I indicated, if victims are listening, then they know that that is there and to help them in relation to that. So, Madam President, to wrap up, as I indicated, we can do what needs to be done by way of making these institutions better, but in order to tackle this problem effectively, we have to understand that these institutions are populated with individuals who are born of a particular environment because we are all um, subject to the experiences we have in life. And if it is you want to solve this problem, we have to go all the way back, Senator Richards, start as early as we can start to inculcate and plant the seeds of the kind of values that we want to see in society. And what I will say, Madam President, is that we must take a long, hard look at ourselves and be true to ourselves. Because once we do that, we can then make the necessary changes that we need to make to the benefit of all in society. With those few words, I thank you. Senator Nakid. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Madam President, I thank you for the opportunity to join in on this very important, significant motion by the Honorable Senator Paul Richards, which, from my understanding, was to examine the deficiencies in the current systems to deal with the incidents of violent crimes against women and girls. And, I'm, and, and this is why I'm, I always seem to be at loggerheads with the government because everything seems to be done and dealt with at a very superficial level. And it goes to some of the contributions that were made today. Now, superficiality has its place. I mean, we have people in very high office who fit that quality. But on a motion like this, I would have imagined that Senator Lazama, who spoke about government can be solely responsible. And the solution is we must harness our energy to improve our attitude and lead by example without saying how. And if the example is, is what we have sometimes heard in the other place where we have an MP like I wouldn't call her name, who spoke about social media pages attacking the woman of the UNC. And I quote, I will gracefully not read about boys' feuds, pink palaces, fights about office, woman scorned, woman horned. And this is on the hand side. And this was submitted on the 27th of January, 2021. So, Yes, indeed, abuse is not solely of a physical nature, and sometimes it is woman on woman, and sometimes it is verbal, and it can be extremely damaging. But when I, I looked at 
the wording of the motion, deficiencies in the current systems. I think it went more than just to the, the penal side of it. And, and, this, and this is, I'm always at loggerheads with, with this government because they deal with things always from the penal side of it. It's never from the developmental side of things. And I mentioned that in one of the previous debates. You know, so we can talk about the TTPS, and we can talk about the punishments and the, 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 the slowness of the criminal justice system, which is something we all know and we agree. But I think Senator DeFreitas, who mentioned it briefly, uh, talked about that, what, what I allude to now, devel developmental, and I, I must give him credit. I thought it was, it was quite appropriate, but it didn't go deep enough. And I'll tell you why. Because we can speak about models that exist in Northern Europe, Western Europe, Central Europe, all over the world, Asia. But we have our own particular circumstances in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is a fact. And I like to take it back always to the grassroots because it's the grassroots people who had the most influence on my life, even though I must admit I came from a, what would be termed a solid middle class family. But my football, my upbringing, my view, everything was shaped by the people I played football with. I must admit that. And these were mostly poor and working class people of Trinidad and Tobago from all demographics. And as I remember, something that remained with me to my life and helped me in my choice, as I, <laughs> as I wanted to marry, was a, a man called Clipper, who had worked in the Caribbean bottling plant, I imagine, in Chanfleur, all his life. He said something more profound than anything I had read from Tolstoy, Plato, Socrates, he said one time on the block, the best woman, the best woman for a man is a woman who does not change how she looks at that man in the bad times. And this has so many layers to it that I'll go into now. Because a lot of what we see in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of violence towards women, as I mentioned in our debate on sexual offenses, is not only about violence for sex. Sometimes it's violence born of frustration, immense frustration about the situation, economic, educational, social, and we have to admit that here. So it doesn't happen in a vacuum. That violence that we are talking about doesn't happen in a vacuum. As a matter of fact, nothing does. There are always underlying reasons. So before we get to the criminal justice system and the lethargic nature of it, we could, we could deal with that most important system that we sometimes neglect, which is a family support system. That is a system in itself. When we erode the family support system by cutting education, as this government has done, by not being astute and wise enough in social grants, that is also has an effect on, on the family support system. And several, I've seen several narratives lately in the newspaper, and it has been excellent. I've seen from both sides, people who support the government, people who support the opposition, and they have been excellent. And they all seem to note that it's not about one demographic is smarter than the other, because a lot of people like to put things in this country according to race, unfortunately. But it's not about that, that, that part of it. That, is, that demographic never comes into it. What is it? What it is about, people advance in education, and all studies will show that in all countries, when there's a solid family support system behind them. 
What has happened is that we have certain demographics in this country who have maintained a solid family support. Despite what might be termed or perceived as slights against them or attempts to undermine their family support. And then we have other demographics, and we have to be very clear about it. When we look, there's no coincidence that these incidents of violence that we see are mostly recorded in the hotspots or so-called impoverished communities along the east-west corridor or in the rural areas. And that is a fact. Look at, at any crime rap or, or, or any report. All of these incidents, in, incidences come from areas that have been socially and economically deprived. So why don't we launch from there? Why don't we look at that, not just in a, on a superficial level, but a more in-depth level? So when we talk about keeping that family support, maintaining a, that legacy of family and faith-based communities that we used to have in Trinidad and Tobago, and where, where did we divert from that? Then we have to look and ask, because it has been said here, that the government can be solely responsible and there must be more bipartisanship and there must be even, as Senator DeFreta said, nonpartisan activity, which for me makes no sense. It's all about politics, politics in a marriage, politics in a community, politics in everything. And we have to deal with it. What we have to hope for is that people or people with the resources, and that is the government. Whether we like it or not, that is it. The government has the resources to take the actions that could affect the deficiencies, and I read it again, in the current systems. The government, in truth and in fact, they are well placed to deal with these things. So my opinion, and slightly a recommendation is, has this government done anything as far as initiatives, programs, workshops within the community, within these areas that we speak about, that proffer, unfortunately, most of these incidences? Has the government, in fact, truth and in fact, done anything other than a so-called Economic, economic Recovery Committee. Until now, we have yet to see any recommendation from that community implemented. I've spoke with a couple people on that committee, and they've said that nothing has been implemented. And it was promised, it was promised that that committee would do something and allocate resources to these community, communities that we consider hotspots. As usual, only talk and no action from that side. So, Madam President, when you look at this motion, not abstractly, but you look at it and the substance of it, we could reduce the amount of people that actually go into that penal part of it. And I keep having to make that point over and over again with this government, because they don't seem to recognize the importance of attacking this issue from the development phase of it before we reach the mal maladaptive characteristics that we see. I, I, I don't believe it is, it is within human nature from, for men to wake up, or women, and want to act violently, except in, in few cases. And having two sons who study psychology, plus a sister who is past, who, who is past president, uh, you know, it's not, it's not something that's compulsive. It's not like pedophilia, violence against women. It, there, there are a lot of underlying circumstances. And funnily enough, it has, a lot to do with, it has a lot to do with frustration. 
And that, I go back to that quote from my partner, Clipper, that how important is it for a man to feel some sense of worth to his woman, to his family, to his wife? How important that is, not to, to look at his woman and see that she sees some value and he not feel impotent. He not feel disenfranchised, disempowered. And that feeling, Madam President, leads to a lot of the violence that we see in domestic abuse. And that happens when the man is unable to, to provide for his family in most instances. So he turns to alcoholism, he turns to drugs, to escape the reality of being unable to provide for his family. And I'm citing these instances because these are the instances that really prevail in the so-called hotspot communities in Trinidad and Tobago. They are always fighting against the tide, always fighting to put food on the table. No one here can imagine those circumstances, no one. How it is that you have to worry between breakfast and lunch how are you going to provide that if you can afford that lunch or that breakfast? No one can imagine that feeling for a man to look at his wife. What Shadow used to say? Shadow used to say, how do you woman look at you when you can't buy the box of KFC? You know what I mean? Poverty is hell. So when you, when you cut jobs, you cut CPEP workers, for example, your salary, which by all metrics, it's not a great salary. OK, you cut it. But then, let's say, by the same token, you increase in the media review the amount, the allocation, by millions, $43 million. You think the Hill, Madam President, and the rural areas, they're not watching? They're not hearing? So who, if you cut the CPEP workers, 10,000 their salaries, and you give that millions? 43 million. So who is that money? You're suffering the people. You think the hill and rural areas, they're not aware of it? They are aware of it, Madam President. The men are seeing that. And they feel powerless. And they act out. And no one is saying, especially me, especially me, that once they act out, they shouldn't be punished accordingly. And I'll tell you all a story, true story. There was once a beautiful, angelic woman who used to love to go to the market in Sao. Loved, she loved to go every Friday she'd go. Everybody knew her. So she took her, this is in the early 80s. This is it. the advent of hard drugs in Trinidad and Tobago was Honorable Minister of Agriculture used to allude to in his writings in a more enlightened time. And the beginning of the 80s, what we like to say? Sprungers, drug addicts, everywhere. Everywhere. So this beautiful angelic woman, on her way to the market with her daughter, was assaulted. Bag ripped them from her, blouse. She used to love to wear these flowery brown blouses, ripped. She looked like almost sexually assaulted. It was ripped so far down. So her husband, serious man, <laughs> hard man, told his four sons, find that person. Find him, as for sure, you will lose your father to incarceration. The four sons did find him. You see, Madam President, on reflection, when that father was asked years later why he 
who never did anything outside of the law, had told his four sons to take the necessary action to exact some measure of justice, some measure of revenge, he answered to his four sons, I did not do it for your mother. I did it for your sister, for her to know that any of these actions against women will be dealt with severely. Because in our system in Trinidad and Tobago, God knows how long it would have took. And my point is, he recognized the generational effects of violence on women. He wasn't proud of it years later, but he made his point to his four sons. So, Madam President, I have no, no pity whatsoever when the crime is committed. But my interest, complete interest, is how do we mitigate those actions before they come into play? And that's why I come to the deficiencies again, which I, I didn't think was dealt with in, a more, in the most profound way here in the Senate. Because you're talking about systems, you're talking about not only social support and family support systems, you're talking about the ability of the government to communicate public awareness systems. Has the government done enough to put public awareness systems in place with commercials, with, 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 with ads, with everything. So maybe instead of a transportation hub costing $400,000 that looks like a bus shed, they could have put up some banners, banners advocating against violence against women throughout the communities. Instead of putting up signs advertising alcohol up and down the east-west corridor, only in the so-called poor and hotspot communities. How come we don't see these banners for alcohol in Goodwood Park and Bayshore? Why only in communities up the east-west corridor? Why? We know alcohol is a problem. That leads to a lot of domestic abuse. All of these things we have to consider. Where are the community support systems? Where are the workshops, the initiatives, the programs to have people come in and talk to these communities? Senator DeFreitas alluded to talking in schools and, 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 and in secondary schools and then in primary schools. That is also an option. But that requires government resources, government intervention. So there must be a shift away, especially in this government, from unnecessary expenses. For all kind of manners of, of rental buildings and all that, let's put some money into things that make a difference in this society. I repeat, Madam President, the hills and the rural areas are watching. They can see when we are being disingenuous. They can see when we are being hypocritical in our utterances. So, Madam President, I would like to see that this be dealt with from the a more developmental side of things. As I always allude to, no one wakes up in the morning, no man, no woman, with the idea to go against the norms of society, to break the law. We have to consider these exigencies. We have to look at that. We have to look at that in depth. It cannot be superficial like what we've seen here. Madam President, 
It was mentioned by Senator Freitas that Senator Bacchus will talk about maybe a, a possibility of eliminating the kinks and so in one of the systems would be the digitization of the, of, of the system and so, and it will solve many, many of the problems, this according to Senator Defeaters. But I remember Senator Lachmi Dial, she raised the importance of this in her motion on the adjournment. She did that, she spoke about that, to have electronic filings and so. So we mentioned that. So we know it's not only about saying that we should all hold hands together and sing Kumbaya. We have to put resources where the resources are necessary. And not only on the penal side of things, and I repeat that, it must be in the community programs, social support systems, family support systems, government, communication, and public awareness systems. If we can do that, Madam President, if for once we can take a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach, maybe, just maybe, all the other superficial talk about in a police station, if a female officer or a male officer take that, that's, one swallow does not a summer make, How, on either side of it. What we need to do is always, especially when it comes to these kinds of motions, looking at the systems and their deficiencies. There must be resources. There must be serious intent to deal with it in a meaningful way. And I like uh, when Senator Lazama talked about improving our attitude. And I, I once mentioned that here in this honorable chamber about improving the attitude about, towards our service commissions as well. And I was told, or it was said after, that you, if you improve your attitude towards a car, it doesn't put gas in the car. For me... Senator Nakid, you have five more minutes. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. For me, that was a uh, inanity. It was, it was totally irrelevant. It is important to improve our attitude to how we look at addressing violence against women and girls. But we must take that decision. We must take that de decision to realize how we have failed the women and girls. And it comes way, all the way back to the family structure. And I repeat that. And that has to do with allocation of education, making sure that people are well-placed, well-trained, and that needs more than just economic recovery committee talk. It needs resources, it needs action, and it needs something that this government never does, which is implement properly. So, Madam President, with those few words, I would like again to thank Senator Richards for bringing this to light. And I look forward, this time, to a meaningful and substantial resolution to how we address these deficiencies in these systems that we have. I thank you, Madam President. Senator D'Alcy. Thank you, Madam President, for allowing me to partake in this discussion. Madam President, um, Senator Richards must be thanked for this, bringing this motion, because it certainly is something, you know, we saw certain activities occurring, social marches, um, vigils and whatnot. And it seems that the country was in a position where uh, it was trying to speak out, trying to uh, ask the powers that be to do something for the women who were actually um, um, raped and went missing. So therefore, the, 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 there were various pe reasons why people came out. People came out in these vigils, candlelight movements, what, what, what not. To, some to show the authorities that they were fed up. They wanted action on crime. Some to get, um, to, to, to get together in solidarity with our women. Some 
political instigators trying to whip up support. Some may have come out also, you know, uh, just to socialize. So whatever reason, this social act activism did make the government recant on its stance with pepper spray. So it has its effect. And you see, the thing we want to see is that social change has a collective power of the citizens to bring about change and shows that we are just not powerless and we could create the change we wish to see. We can foster constructive change by bringing together social activists, philanthropists to catch the attention of our leaders to cause a shift in how we can get things done without violence or disrespect to our leaders. Understand that we need to nudge them sometimes in the right direction what's in the public interest. What they're saying is, is Vox popular, um, popular or popular I say that you know you have to see, listen to the people, and government might have to probably refocus on the citizens who may want to come out. Now, Madam, when we had this motion here, it was not just in Trinidad and Tobago. We had to appreciate worldwide we saw a change going. Women, people were coming out. Was it the COVID had people frustrated, locked up, and they were just coming out for one of those reasons I mentioned in 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 Mexico. Uh, you know, a hundred, uh, in Mexico, you found that there were 80,000 people marched on International Women's Day. And two cases recently caused major problem um, in terms of having, uh, there was a, a seven-year-old who was kidnapped and her body was found. And, uh, you know, um, actually, uh, uh, it, social media took that right through. And then there was another case where a lady called Ingrid was murdered and disemboweled and skinned by her, her boyfriend. So they marched a day without a woman. And they, they slogan was that, a day without a woman, where they said women should stay home and protest, don't go to work, don't go to school, just a day without a woman. Because about 10 women a day are killed in Mexico. So it's not just Trinidad, we have that problem. The Mexican president, um, you know, came out and said it wouldn't be a, make a big impact on the economy. And he had been criticized for his comment where he said uh, that the conservative rivals are behind the protests. It sounds similar to what I heard a leader here say. Madam, besides this occurring in, in Mexico, Australia had a case also where a, 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 a worker was actually raped in the Australian parliament. And this worker found that because where it occurred, she was not taken seriously. And 40,000 women came out to march in Australia. No, sorry, on, on, it was 110,000 women took to the streets across Australia because um, the organizer of the march said that we have to um, get to the government to take uh, crimes against women seriously. And Brittany Huggins, Higgins, who was raped in Parliament, Madam, she actually said that um, there's a horrible societal acceptance of sexual violence. We need a dramatic male cultural shift to assist our women. Madam, there was a, there, even Japan had a case. And I, I must say, I, I laughed at the case in Japan, and my wife actually uh, clouted me. So I, I was abused. Because here you are, Mr. Um, Yush, Yushiro Mori, 83 years old, was quoted as saying, women talk too much. And that how, um, when I told my wife that, and I laughed, she said, how I could, you know, laugh at this. But it was, I was just teasing my wife. And women came out and marched for that. And Mr. Murray had to resign his position. She, he was in charge of the, the um, Olympic Committee. And he had to come, uh, when women took to the street and said, we refuse to know our place. We don't tolerate discrimination against women. And he made that mention when he said that if we increase the number of female board members, we have to make sure their speaking time is restricted somewhat because they have difficulty in finishing, which is annoying. So he paid the price, he resigned. But you see, women are, are taken to the streets and women are marching and women are trying to, 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 to uh, you know, to uh, demand their right. Madam, this piece of, um, this motion here uh, brings me to question, how do we question the government's um, um, ability so far in terms of handling the situation? But it's not just Trinidad, I say it's worldwide. Right now in, um, in Greece, there's a, a big debate going on because Caroline Crouch, a 20-year-old British national who got married to uh, a, a native there, she actually was killed and her husband told the police people broke in the house, killed the family pet and tortured her in front of the couple's 11-month-old baby. So it's, even though that happened on 11, he only recently, two days ago, um, um, uh, you know, admitted he was the one. So it, it, it's all over. We have to get this um, fixed. So how do we judge the uh, government's um, performance? Madam, uh, when I looked at a recent case 
where someone took a taxi with a friend. She did everything right. That person's body was found some days later. They found the police took too long. That person actually, um, I, what happened, the body was found too long. The system was criticized because the autopsy report, the first one is inconclusive, the other one um, gave a different value. Then there was talk about um, police um, taking pictures of people in the station. Um, then there was talk about people falling out some chairs and damaging themselves. So are we, are we banana republic when you see that state of events? I would have said yes, but madam, I looked at what happened in UK. In UK, there was a case recently where Sarah, uh, uh, Sarah Everard, a UK lass who went missing on March 3rd, her body was discovered on, 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 on the 10th. So the, the criticism in the UK, where we always say it has the best system and we should follow. Sarah took precautions. She left her friend's house while it was still daylight. She took a, a longer route, populated route. She wore brightly colored clothes and, and shoes she could run in. She, there was a, a criticism there about police delaying hand in the case. There was criticism there where they, um, uh, twice in custody, the accused who was there had to be hospitalized for head injuries. I wonder if he fell from a chair. A probe called um, into the police handling of this um, accused. And his court hearing was the 9th of July. And there is a backlog, madam, of 56,000 con cases in England and Wales. And many uh, will, go, will, will not go before a, a jury uh, um, till uh, 2022. So our AG must be praised for having virtual courts. Our, our AG must be praised by having a better system because they are complaining they are crowded courts in a COVID time. And you see, even in that case, the first post-mortem was inconclusive and a second one had to come about. So therefore, even when we criticize our local doctor here, look what's happening in the UK. Criticisms there also from the crime survey show that so many women are victims of rape and attempted rape, but just a minuscule amount were actually reported to the police, and there's just a small amount that was actually convicted. Same logic, same argument we're hearing here. Previous history of sexual misconduct from the accused in that case, who um, exposed himself in South London, same, uh, same thing we're hearing here. We don't know about past conduct. And you see, um, the uh, police also refused to give a vigil citing COVID-19 restrictions, similar to what we heard here when we had a ARIMA refusal also. And Monday, after a meeting of the criminal justice tax, was the government promised to increase CCTV. We, hear, we are hearing the same logic here in the UK. It was, it was, you know, it was, it was a residence doorbell camera which actually uh, got this footage. And the movement there came about called Reclaim These Streets. So therefore, it's the same um, uh, instance in first world countries. Madam, what I'm suggesting to is we have to have um, an instance where the, you know, even when we are trying to look at women and, 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 and protect them, we have to realize that um, women must, must, if they are going into a taxi now, because remember we have the event of a, of a PH uh, menace, I think, in society. And, you know, even though we have had good things government did, this given us the sexual registry, child marriage, um, a, a GBU, Electronic Monitoring Act, a court system um, that, now, that recognizes the battered woman syndrome so women can get through with manslaughter instead of murder, sexual harassment in the workplace, which has to be tweaked still, virtual court. These are some good things. But you see, the persons in the, the government in the driver's seat must are carrying us for this drive for the next few years. And we have to read, make sure that we are going in the same direction to arrive at the destination safely. Madam, PH has been, PH um, taxis is illegal. And I'm saying if you have an illegal system, why do we want to legalize it? Get rid of that system. Have a system where you can hire um, uh, persons, get a rental company to give the cars at a cheaper rate. And because, madam, the taxi association is complaining that they are at a disadvantage with this PH drivers who are illegal, not even paying tax. They don't pay taxi badge or insurance. So therefore, we should not um, attempt to legalize an illegal activity. We could institute something quickly. We can put something in there where we would be able to um, give our women a, a greater chance of, 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 of travel, because that's one of the constitution freedom of movement. Now, madam, we had the Uber 
had drivers here, over 500 drivers and 7,000 active users. And there was some confusion between them and the, the government, and they decided to pick up and go. I don't know if it was taxes or whatnot, but we could implement something like that. We need to. We need to. And, and Senator, uh, uh, the Senator in charge of the digital transformation, he can provide something that we can get taxis that we could probably track persons. He can provide a system where women, before they go into a taxi, they could take a snapshot and give that uh, snapshot to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a yeah, uh, iCloud, so you know exactly who you're going to. And if a, a taxi objects, you're taking my taxi, we will be worn out of that. So we should have proper, we should have a new, a shift in, in travel protocol. We should also have the, um, the, the um, you know, uh, besides having the personal pity of these um, taxis you're going to institute something that we can help our individuals. Madam, the police methods needs also to be um, 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 uh, address because you see sometimes they, they, you, you find that it was mentioned that you go into a station and you meet a male or a female and they may not take you seriously. We need to get that ethic change in the police service. You see, I think we need back the community policing in greater amounts. We need the community patrol so they can know the community. They can know which houses that there are um, uh, instances of domestic violence that occur. And once a community police officer knows the community, we can have a warning. You see, collateral damage has can occur, um, you, know, um, you know, where even with gangs, because a gang may now don't want you to come and, and check out a, a woman in their neighborhood. A gang will have gang um, um, initiative rapes. Uh, gangs will have, um, they perpetrate violence, which, uh, you know, permeates society. And, uh, you know, we could probably use the SOE to take out those few gangs that are there, because they perpetrate the violence which actually um, um, pervades our society. Women are not really free to walk the streets. And then sometimes when you're getting cat calls from oh, elderly men um, saying inappropriate comments, uh, young girls walk in, snap them, put them on social media as these wolves who are just teasing them, embarrass them. So therefore, we have to, to, to put, you know, we'll be thankful for the, the GBU unit, but we have to let the, the population know we are now willing to let you come forward. A lot of rape victims do not come forward. They don't like the system. They feel embarrassed. They feel nothing will happen. They will not get justice. We have to convince them. You see, this is, this is that even the DMO coming out to do the swabs could be females, do it in a humane manner. We have to actually, the challenge is not really the government, you know, so much. The challenge is to have the institutions and the institutions in place that is such a good um, running so properly for our women and they will now have the feet to come out because we have the institutions there just to get it, tweak it to run properly. M Madam, um, uh, the, the, another problem we see here is domestic, domestic violence. This has increased in, in our um, you know, pandemic. They say it's a shadow pandemic and we are seeing now more bedroom killers than before. And, you know, we have to educate persons to leave. And a challenge we have always had is women don't want to leave their men. A lot of women come out, they complain that to a police and they go back to their males. Some of them are psychologically bonded to their males. Some of them, it's like the Stockholm syndrome or what you call the traumatic um, bonding theory where women uh, will, will, will make a complaint about a, a gentleman and go back. There's a cycle of violence and so we have to appreciate if we are going to take a dent in domestic violence. You know, government is really not to blame for domestic violence. They don't know what's going on in the bedroom. It's for their relatives, the, the, the victim themselves, to have that power to come out. But if a victim is psychologically trapped, we need to change that law where we can um, go after these um, individuals. You see, um, even under the, our Mental Health Act, we can go after mentally ill patient if that patient is deluded um, and whatnot. We may have to look at the domestic violence law in such a way that we will figure if our relatives, if our police, if doctors come out and say that their uh, 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 sister is in a home locked up, she got beaten before, you could provide that evidence. I think we should have a tribunal who could look at it, a doctor, a judge, and a lay person to say, that person's at risk. Look, she came out, she gave a report, she changed her mind, but look, the medical um, record show that. Look, the, 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 the um, relatives come and are pleading. So therefore, persons may say, and we have attorneys here who say we are taking away the liberty of people, but I'm thinking to define liberty for people with delusions about their partners, that is an injustice. They are caught in that mind trap. And if we leave them there, some of them will be victims. Um, it's really taken involuntary um, a decision to take somebody involuntary, and it's like rescuing uh, a victim from a, a cult. You know, we have something called exit, exit counseling. I say we have to have the laws changed in such a way that 
if it is done in a manner, just as how we have the, the Mental Health Act, that we formulate the laws, uh, that we can now have that hearing, that we could bring that person away against their own um, rights to come in. Madam, also in England, there's the, what you call the Clearwood a case where they actually had a register now for um, patients who had a violent past. You see, um, Clearwood had a boyfriend, George Appleton, who killed himself after. But he strangled and burned her. And afterwards, it was found that he had cases before, two cases before of violent um, history of beating people. And even though it was against Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the English Common Law, the English decided to make a policy decision that if you have an individual who um, have been violent before, the police could have a duty to come and warn you, or you can apply, your family could apply, you could come and say, what is the past of my persons? The lawyers will scream against it that it's privacy laws, but if we don't change, we will continue seeing the killings. Australia and Canada looked at this Claire's law from UK and tried to have that shift in the law. So we need to have that shift. We need to have change in philosophies of care needed as a society where we can um, try to get those individuals into therapy. Because domestic violence will continue there unless we can change that law to get those individuals in. And um, there's something called the as I'm saying, the, the, the evidence-based um, um, prosecution, where you don't wait for those persons to come and say, well, you know, you know persons will come out and they, 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 they make a claim. And the evidence-based prosecution looks at evidence that you have, past history of abuse, um, 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 you look at pictures of the, the individual, um, you know, and you look at those things and you put together a case. And because the whole idea is doctors have to be trained to document the victim's account. Any sort of accompanying persons could co co cooperate it. You have to train our uh, gender violence, violence unit to start collecting and filing evidence the minute they are aware of an abuse with the ideal that the victims may change their mind and get the photographic evidence. So even though they change their mind, you could still now go in and go after this. So it, it is really evidence-based prosecution rather than, you know, than waiting for them to die. Because if they die, you will now go back after the death and try to formulate, oh, were they abused? Do you have evidence? You're doing it after the death. What is the sense of doing it after the death? And understand these individuals are psychologically entrapped. So you have to have pro-arrest policies where the police encourage to make arrests whenever probable causes exist, regardless of the victim change of heart. So we have to change our mindset. The prosecutors have to be on board with this. This is one way we could help the domestic violence situation. The Senator Rambarat spoke on untouchables in his thing. And yeah, I untouchables. I remember there was a past um, minister in the previous government. Uh, and there was some allegation on the airline. He touched somebody's body part. Even in the, this administration, there were another minister who there was an a, 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 a inquiry into his inappropriate behavior those persons should be admonished publicly. They should not have messages sent to our young ones because of certain positions you would get away. And you know, so therefore you remember it was a time where a priest had a lot of allegations of abuse and it's when he went to Ireland, then he was caught. There was a, a curator of the zoo. The man wrote beautiful books on animals. It was when he touched down in America, he was caught. Those were untouchables here. Ken Starr in the United States was the independent persecutor who went after President Clinton who said, um, well, oral sex is not sex. You need probably an independent department where if you have allegations of any sort of an imp improper um, sexual conduct from persons in authority, you can go to this department to investigate it. The WHO in 2006 said that we, you know, interpartner violence against women and girls, against children. This is something since 2006 they begged the medical fraternity to go after. Madam, um, I heard Senator DeFetis spoke about starting from before. Yes, the Ministry of Education has to educate children to come out and say when they were abused because we have a section of society, children are abused, we don't even know. So we have to develop Ministry of Education to get to those children. Once you can come and you can tell your teacher, you can tell your social worker, we can take that child and, and, and nurture that child and rescue that child, we need the children's authority in place, but things have to run properly. Look what happened to certain children in the children's authority recently. Care. We need systems to work. This is what we need, dedicated people. Um, systems will fail, but we have to put things. The judiciary needs to get faster. We always will talk about night courts and whatnot. I'm still waiting for all these um, courts to open up because we need much faster, um, um, uh, much faster um, handling of these matters. Uh, um, 
what I say, uh, Madam President, is we, we, I mentioned when we were doing the registry list about the violent, um, uh, you know, pornography could affect the minds of children. We have to appreciate this as a fact. Children seeing pornography, seeing women uh, in certain acts, and it, it, it puts in their mind that it's okay to rape, it's okay to beat. So therefore, sometimes we have to know how we are going to tackle that. I say sisters, instead of going and, and marching against the government, you should go a sister against sister movement to tell uh, your sisters, stop making these um, uh, pornographic material. Let's take you in. Let's, let's educate you. Let's put you in a different job. Madam, there are plenty, plenty um, different, um, different reasons why people may be violent. You see, you have um, risk factors for intimate partner violence and sexual violence. Low level of education. Ministry of Education can help that. Exposure to child mistreatment. Rescue the child. Put them in children's authority. But recognize the ones. Let them speak out. Good touch, bad touch. Let's know which child has been abused at home. Um, people witnessing violence. So Ministry of National Security has to go into the, the gangs and uh, attack them. Antisocial personality disorder. We have to recognize those people who are infringing the law. Um, uh, infringing the law, that they, 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 are, they are driving on the shoulder, they, they're disobeying the law, they're in trouble. We have to track them medically and say, hey, those individuals, if they are antisocial persons, they can lead to violence. Alcohol use, madam, a risk factor. I still see alcohol coming in the country and we have a problem with, 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 um, with, with, with foreign exchange. I went to the grocery and it's about how much I counted, uh, about 80 something bottle of different types of alcohol. Vodka with orange juice, vodka with, with pineapple. Look, if alcohol is such a harmful effect in domestic violence, and also in, you know, even people who murder, sometimes alcohol could be, uh, they, uh, some of them say they're under the influence. Some may have different reasons. We have to tackle the alcohol um, abuse. Harmful masculine effects, toxic masculinity. This is a cultural acceptance. I'm macho, I'm the head of the home. Uh, my wife not supposed to own, uh, take more money than me. So you have that. And men must learn also that to take on. Men must learn to say, hey, get away from this situation. If a woman has cheated on you, you don't have to go and kill her. Come to us, let's counsel you. Make, have a men's group. And you see, this is the problems we are seeing here. And again, Attitudes that can do in multiple partners. Madam, our culture, both of them, our songs, sometimes the mean women. And I'm saying, if you look at Calypso and Soka, who's only talking about jamming and whining and sex and whatnot, and bottom in the road and these things, we could curb these songs, you know, because if you're going to win a prize that my taxpayer money is going to pay for, you better, government could put judges there who have characters who will say, we are only going to allow songs to win if they think something nation building. No bottom in the road, no sort of wine and wine. So have the judges there that if I know I'm going to sing, I'm going to win taxpayers' money. I don't mind if, if it's a private in, uh, institution, um, uh, you know, and, but if you take my taxpayers' money to encourage uh, that sort of songs, I think we need nation building judges in those calypso confrontations. But it's not just there. I saw my child listen to a song the other day, it had F words. They had persons with big gold chain, they had um, cars, marijuana, and I was appalled. I, I, I said, what you are listening, but the young persons will always listen to nonsense that the other generation will oppose. I remember even when the Beatles came out, the parents didn't like it. When Michael Jackson hold his crutch and wine, some people um, um, objected. When Elvis Presley was there even before, uh, they banned him from TV. So we, even though I would um, be appalled by these songs, it does really affect the children and violence. So we have to look at what we take as culture. And community norms also we have to look at. The law, um, we find that if we ascribe community norms that the status of men are higher than women, but that's changing. Because look, we have a president who is a female, the president of the Senate is a female, the, the, the speaker is a female, so it's changing, it's changing. I mean, um, women have touched all avenues of our, except the Chief Justice's post. Um, so therefore, the, 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 we, we, that status is changing, I'm happy. Again, if you have low levels of women um, access to employment. This is another area where it opens the doorway to sexual harassment. So therefore you have to have equal status in pay employment. And low level of uh, gender uh, um, um, equity laws. So mother, you see, COVID, when COVID came about, eh, it actually um, was more harmful to the woman because COVID actually, more women lost their jobs, more women suffered, more women were at home, and more women were abused. So COVID to me uh, was unfortunate where it, it, it raised all our, our uh, you know, 
the, our, uh, what I would want to put it, the, the social um, ills that we see into the homes. And it, it's a pity that that happened, but we have to have things in place. Madam, I would, I would like to say that, um, you know, when we look at the society and we think that it's just women. Now, this um, motion that my brother Senator Rose actually speaks on women and women affairs, but society on the whole has this violent tendency. Society on a whole, we have to address the causes of violence. The Professor Hutchinson did a study where he said violence and self-injury, where he did, a, you know, violence and self-injury have emerged as major, a major social, public, and mental health concerns among our men. And according to a journal article where he looked at the demographic features of homicide and suicide victims in Trinidad and Tobago, they found that, you know, we are a culture of violence. Males are killing themselves and each other more than females, and the ratio is three to one. And victims of homicides were located pri um, primarily in the northeast regions of Trinidad associated with African ethnicity and school dropouts, and suicide was associated with um, central geography and Indian ethnicity with alcohol consumption. Again, alcohol knocking on the doors. So we can, we can, we can hit that alcohol, make the raise, raise it to 21 as the state has, and educate our individuals. We have to educate. So we see right there that there are, the push has to be on education. The push has to be on um, training our young ones about the ills of alcohol. So, so tackling crime again is something that we have to thank the... the Senator um, Dial Singh, you have five more minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam. We have to thank the, the um, Commissioner of Police for the Gender-Based Unit, it's, it's going on. We still have to see that, um, that it's full effect. We have to make sure that any deficiencies, we are willing to come out and say that there are deficiencies. We have to appreciate that what's happening uh, in Trinidad, it's a global phenomenon. Um, uh, we are not a banana republic, as we say, because the first world countries have their own deficiencies. I guess all over the world, people will have to start working and seeing how the systems were there, old systems, how we could keep up, how we could make it, um, keep up with the times, how we could do what it was really started, how, how we could you know, evolve our system to evolve the law, as I mentioned, have therapeutic jurisprudence to change the law to help the, uh, domestic violence victims. We have to get that subset of people who are not coming out. We have to get the subset of the individuals who are raped and in their homes who are not coming forth. And I think the challenge really is really, you know, uh, uh, crime against women has a serious social consequence, eh? and it places a burden on the economic resources of a country. And in this post-oil and COVID era, we must get serious. They are, these are all preventable debts and with preventable economic strain to the state. But we need the victims to come out of the shadows and government's duty is to put the best systems in place to really let them have the confidence that they can come out and they can get justice. Thank you, madam. Senator Mark.
Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, any opportunity, any effort, every attempt made to promote and advance equality, justice for our women and girls must be welcomed, must be appreciated. And therefore, it's against that particular background that we would like to give our support to this matter, this motion, I should say, before this Honorable Senate. Because, Madam President, there is no doubt that women in our country and girls face serious assaults through crime and violence perpetrated against them by, in the main, men. So this particular motion by my colleague, Senator Paul Richards, seeking to address this issue and calling on the government to address the deficiencies in the current system to deal with this incidence of violence, of violent crimes against women and girls has to be located and appreciated. Madam President, I, we have said that the centerpiece of any policy aimed at addressing the root cause of violence against women and girls has to be located in gender equality in our society. There can be no gainsaying the fact, Madam President, that we can no longer focus on symptoms, but we must focus and address the root causes of crime, violence, and criminality directed against our women and our girls, whom have become literally endangered species in our civilization. And Madam President, as we seek to address this issue, the move of the motion has called for the government to promote and to advise on legislative improvements through delivery, service delivery, via government agencies to provide some protection. And the move of the motion goes further to call on the government within a three-month period to bring a legislative agenda and policy implementation plan to more effectively address the rising incidence of violence against women and girls. Madam President, 
we would like to say from the very outset that the approach that we have taken in this country, particularly under this administration, is one in which focus has been paid and placed on suppression, crime suppression, and punishment. And the Attorney General has indicated that corporal punishment is being looked at as a way or as a means of addressing violence and criminality in our country. But if we are to really revolutionize and to bring about transformation, as my colleague said, Senator Nackett, if we are to bring about a new perspective, a new attitude towards this phenomenon, then, Madam President, we have to take a different approach. And I'm hoping that in doing so, we would look, Madam President, at the root cause of this malaise, this crisis of crime, violence, and criminality against women and girls. And that is why, Madam President, I would like to emphasize the need for gender equality in our society. And that requires, Madam President, to bring about that we need to focus on equal rights, responsibilities, and opportunities so that we can enable all individuals to achieve their full rights and potential to be healthy and to contribute to health development and benefits from that process, Madam President. And therefore, we would want to ensure that when this motion is approved, that the government in the spirit that it would be passed would honor, Madam President, this motion. Madam President, there is no doubt that there is need for us to take and to have a multi, first of all, a comprehensive, multifaceted approach to this issue of violence and crime directed against our women. Madam President, whether we look at domestic violence in all its dimensions, or we look at sexual violence and abuse, we have to get down to the roots. And why does it, or these particular means of aggression against our women and abuse against our girls, why do they persist in our country? And Madam President, power relations, control, these are some of the elements, ingredients that continue to be responsible for what we are experiencing. And therefore, in this particular matter, we have to pay attention to education, to training, and we have to focus, Madam President, 
on our youths and our children in particular so that they can develop a different attitude from very tender ages towards this question and issue of gender equality in our society. So this point has to be emphasized because if you lose that point, Madam President, we would be just dealing with the symptoms of a larger problem in our nation and in our civilization. We must work towards the promotion both in terms of legislation and action at the, the cultural level as it relates to bringing about justice, equality, and rights for all, Madam President. Madam President, we cannot, in this particular matter, this motion that is before us, it cannot be viewed in a one-dimensional approach. It has to be comprehensive, Madam President. And therefore, there's an organization that deals with gender-based violence. It's called the Alliance for State Action to end gender-based violence. And Madam President, I believe it's very important that we recognize that this concept of gender-based violence, which is what we are dealing with here, women and girls, Madam President, being subject to violence in our society, that requires, Madam President, that we all view this phenomena as a national emergency requiring immediate, short, immediate, short, medium, and long-term policies and actions in our society. And Madam President, whatever we are doing to bring about justice and equality as a strategy on a holistic basis to address this matter of violence and crime against our women and girls, we must, as all of us have said, pay attention to resources, Madam President. We must locate appropriate resources in our national strategy to end gender-based violence in this context. Madam President, it calls for us reviewing and strengthening the social development system to address the drivers of crime, violence, and insecurity in a way, Madam President, which centers gender and social inequalities and place these at the forefront, Madam President. So this is not a superficial and artificial response to a matter that requires deep analytical assessment and evaluation, Madam President. And we must come up with the appropriate strategy in order to address the injustices that our citizens women in this instance, and girls suffer. Madam President, we also have, when we are addressing this issue of violence against our women, violent crimes against our women and girls, we cannot escape, Madam President, to look at the necessity and almost the imperative of improving and addressing the deficits in the current 
criminal justice system. In, and that requires, Madam President, a complete review as to how we treat violence as it relates to our women. Because, Madam President, when we talk about violence, it is domestic in nature and it is sexual also. And then arising out of it, Madam President, those in the households are exposed. So our girls are exposed to that kind of abuse through violence committed by the male against the female in this instance, might be the mother. So that is an issue, Madam President, we need to address. And that is why when we were discussing another matter recently, we spoke to the issue, Madam President, of maybe establishing a special court to deal with violent crimes committed against our women, particularly sexual offenses and uh, such crimes, Madam President and a specialized court is needed. Madam President, education, psycho-educational psycho interventions, Madam President, cannot be underemphasized. This question has to be addressed on many fronts. And Madam President, prevention is critical. And to prevent crime and violent crimes against our women and our girls, we need to pay attention, Madam President, to this issue of the availability of psycho-educational interventions, particularly, Madam President, for those persons who have been charged with or convicted of violent crimes against our women. And we need to focus that within the principles of accountability and victim safety, Madam President. And therefore, this particular motion that is before us has to be seen in the context of rehabilitation, my, uh, Mr. Vice President, re-restoration and reintegration. It cannot be seen otherwise. Madam um, Mr. Vice President, in this context, when we are seeking to revolutionize our approaches to crime and criminality and violence towards our women folk and our girls in particular, we need to pay attention to bringing about changes to our public transportation system because that has also contributed to the violence that we are experiencing in our nation today. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, I would hope that we would be in a position to bring about the appropriate legislative changes and policy implementation. So that, for instance, what we are trying to achieve in this motion, and by calling on the government to assess the deficiencies in the current system, and to also present to the parliament within a short period, a legislative agenda and policy implementation plan would go a long way, Mr. Vice President, in addressing the rising incidence of violence against women and girls in our society. I would hope also, Mr. Vice President, that the government of Trinidad and Tobago, when they give support to this motion today, which could be unanimously 
adopted. I hope through you, Mr. Vice President, that this motion does not suffer a similar fate that a previous motion experienced. Because we can come here and we can say, Mr. Vice President, we are in support of this motion. We can vote for this motion unanimously. But Mr. Vice President, what happens thereafter? I could vividly recall a motion being unanimously adopted in this parliament to bring about what is called, Mr. Vice President, parliamentary autonomy. This was adopted in the 11th parliament. And this Senate, like we are about to do, unanimously agreed to the resolution. And we call on the government to introduce legislation on parliamentary autonomy during the fourth session of the 11th parliament and to have same referred to a joint select committee of parliament for consideration and report before the end of the fourth session of the 11th parliament. Mr. Vice President, I am sad to report. It saddens me to report that the fourth session has gone the fifth session has gone. The eleventh parliament has gone. And Mr. Vice President, the motion, like this one that we are debating, that will you be unanimously adopted, was never implemented by the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, the Attorney General of this country gave this Senate and, and, and particularly the person who moved this particular motion literally chastised the move of the motion and asked the move of the motion, why didn't your government do it when you were in power? Mr. Vice President, so I am wondering, I'm hoping that the matter that we are debating today will not suffer the same fate that that particular motion suffered at, that, at the time. Mr. Vice President, we must take our business seriously. And no one, no one, including the Attorney General of this country, should show contempt, disrespect, contumely to our Senate when we take a decision to unanimously adopt a motion and is left, it is up to the government thereafter in accordance with our standing order to implement that decision. So Mr. Vice President, I raise this in passing because I'm hoping, hoping my Mr. Vice President that this motion, which we would like to identify with, would not suffer the same faith as an earlier motion. In fact, I think it's too suffered, my, Mr. Vice President. So, Mr. Vice President, some of the actions that we ought to take to ensure that our women folk get the kind of assistance and support in dealing with violence and crime directed at them require the government to provide sufficient financial and organizational support and resources, particularly for the national support systems that provide services to, survive, to survivors and victims uh, Mr. Vice President, we need to provide more shelters for our women, more victim and witness support for our women uh, uh, in this regard. We need to give resources to the Gender and Child Affairs Division, the Emergency Hotline, Mr. Vice President, 
the newly established TTPS gender-based violent unit, violence unit, and other women's organization so that they can provide services for our women and girls and promote gender equality, Mr. Vice President. So we need to do all of these things if we are serious and not really pay lip service to this particular issue. Mr. Vice President, I, I am proposing that when the government is dealing with its legislative program and policy implementation plan, given this matter that is before us, this motion, that the government will look towards the establishment of a social fund as a national budgetary priority in order to support NGO-led shelters and civil society organizations. These are some recommendations that came from a very powerful organization, which I support, called the Alliance for State Action to End Gender-Based Violence. They have put forward several important recommendations and suggestions in an effort, Mr. Vice President, to end, to bring to an end, if that is possible, but a gradual elimination of violence and crime against our women and girls in this society. That same Alliance for State Action called for the establishment of a multi-stakeholder coordination mechanism that includes civil society, academics, ministries working together to end gender-based violence. And I hope, Mr. Vice President, that as we seek towards promoting gender equality, as we seek towards the promotion, Mr. Vice President, of a comprehensive, multifaceted prevention strategy to deal with violence and crime against our women folk, the government of this country would take into account some of these solid recommendations coming from this very powerful organization called Alliance for State Action. And when we talk about Alliance for State Action, we are talking about organizes, organizations such as Coalition Senator, Against Domestic Violence. Senator, you end at 4.55. Yes. Um, do, um, CAISO, G Sex and Gender Justice, Institute for Gender and Development Studies, UWI, the Committee, C, um, Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action, CAFRA, Caribbean Male Action Network, Women's Institute for Alternative Development, Organization for Abused and Battered Individuals, the Shelter for Battered Women and Children, Woman Tra. These are some of the organizations and others that make up this alliance for state action. So, Mr. Vice President, as we lend support to this motion by my honorable colleague, um, Senator Paul Richards, I hope that it is not going to be approved and then dumped in the waste paper basket. I hope at the end of the day, the justice will be done and the government will take its responsibility seriously and effect whatever decisions that we take at the end of this debate by the adoption via support for this particular motion that addresses a very serious issue affecting our women and our girls, violence and crime that is prevalent and we have to come and get to the bottom of it. We cannot deal with just mere symptoms. We have to deal with the roots of that violence and the root, Mr. Vice President, has to deal with gender equality and justice. I thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Minister, in the
Ministry of Public Administration and Digitization. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Pull the microphone close to you. Oh, this one. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the opportunity to contribute on this motion, and a most timely motion at that, as it relates to incidents of violence and crimes against women and girls. The ministry in which I work, the Ministry of Digital, of Public Administration and Digital Transformation, has a key role to play as it relates to changing and transforming what is happening across all of government. And a number of speakers before me would have mentioned uh, transformation. I like to borrow a piece from the, the Attorney General when he speaks about transformation. He always talks about plant and machinery, people, processes, and of course, the law. <laughs> yes, I do. It is, it is, it is exactly that type of approach that is required to address the ills and maladies that actually are putting us in the situation in which we are. In my contribution, I want to talk a bit about the technology and transformation and how we brought some of that to bear on some of the things that are happening today. We're not starting from ground zero to address the issues as identified by Senator Richards. Digital technology can bring you know, huge advantages, but some people also view it as, as one of the facilitators of, of, of the violence of which we're actually trying to, to get rid of. And then if you add to that the existence of a gender divide, a gender digital divide, and then you'd realize that women and girls actually are uh, even more likely targets. If you put COVID-19 into that mix and the, the containment measures associated with that, you would see from all the reports that we've gotten across the world that there's been a significant rise even in domestic violence. And so all of the things that we have to do to get rid of this really has to go as identified by you, Mr. Vice President, in your contribution, really to deal with a holistic and general approach. One of the first things, and it was really ranked through in all of the presentations that have to be addressed, is education. In a Pixel Project 16 for 16 article on December, December 1st, 2019, they quoted the United Nations as saying 31 million girls of primary school age are not in school, global. 17 million of these never enter school, and there are 34 million female adolescents out of work startling numbers. And lack of education, of course, and the contagion pieces associated with that deals leave people in a vulnerable state as it relates to the violence associated with that. To deal with that, you really need to implement, one of the ways that we deal with that is actually to start to implement technology to get to those people in different places. And the government of Trinidad and Tobago has already instituted a number of digital, remote digital platforms to start to deal with that. Many speakers before me would have quoted a number of them. I'm not going to go through them. But even at the, at the younger levels, younger ages, once those programs become available, people snap at them. Only last week, Kareri launched a, it's in their youth and innovation program, a code for mobile app development uh, initiative. It was oversubscribed in one day. And this is not because there were only 10 people, at, only 10 places available. This is talking about 600 places in the initial instance. It took one day to fill it up. So there is an appetite to do it, and there are things being made available. People just have to be made aware of it and take advantage of it. So it is happening. We have an upcoming program where we've partnered with Microsoft, for example, to increase literacy across all of Trinidad and Tobago, the citizens, everyone. Because one of the things that, that holds people back is the fact that they don't have the confidence of the literacy to do what they need to do. They, people can isolate you to abuse you. Things like that have to be addressed in a holistic way, and partnerships like the one we have on that upcoming program, you'll hear about a bit more about it 
as time comes along. Of course, in the rural areas, some of the areas even as Senator Nake would have identified, uh, issues of abuse tend to be more rampant. And one of the ways that you can deal with that is also to bring and use innovative technology to bring levels of literacy and education to those people. In light of that, the, and the thing about those areas is that they tend to be hard to cover. They tend to be not the most attractive areas for technology to be introduced by uh, police who are driven by, by commercial interests. But the Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, in recognizing that and understanding the value that, 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 that exists in those areas and the things that have to be done, would have released the appropriate spectrum and provided it free of charge to a number of, well, to the relevant service providers so that they can expand their networks to cover those areas, both in terms of broadband access and not just token access, but capable quality access to allow for the utilization of it within those areas. Absolutely important that you do that because what that engenders then is people will be able to do self-learning and other pieces of things associated with that from the use of the connected broadband. The rollout of ICT centers, you would have heard about this. Why is that important? It's been rolled out by my ministry and of course the Telecommunications Authority. And it's there to provide rural and underserved communities which have a number of these women and, and children. With centers equipped with digital resources for self-learning and where locals can get together and, and, and everyone can get together, including these women and children. And true peer learning can take a full step towards breaking down some of the socioeconomic and gender barriers that challenge the vulnerable. These are things that we have to do. You couple that with the impending rollout or the continued rollout of Wi-Fi services in a number of areas. All of these things increase connectivity options. And again, that allows for connection to a number of these services that are already available. More are being developed. Technology doesn't always have to be the latest, greatest thing to be effective. There are a number of things that we use today, and maybe people push to the side, but they are still relevant and effective in how we do what we do. Hotlines, something that's been in existence for as far as I could remember. But national hotlines to report incidents like the, what the DTPS has provides counseling, support, and advice to women and girls facing violence and all of those things that exist. And those things are available without charge. Some are with pay, some are being, not only with the TTPS, of course, civil society has theirs as well. And I want to encourage people who uh, have the time and the aptitude to go out and volunteer to assist with those as well. But the, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service also has anonymous crime reporting, which is a significant step in having, because you understand what happens when you are the abused and or someone wants to help you or you want to help yourself. You want to do as, as anonymously as possible. So that is exact and that is the already. The creation of the Sexual Offenders Registry, which the Attorney General and all of us here were able to address. That is also an important piece of what it has to do with this, so that members of the public you know, will have sufficient information to make informed decisions as to how they interact with persons on that, that registry. Again, it helps. Every little bit helps. Social support. If we're going to talk about, and, and Senator Naked raised it, people being able to empower themselves, I think Senator Rambajan spoke about it as well. You're not just looking at the abuser, but the abused, and the, but you're looking at both, the abuser and the abused. In its digital transformation thrust, the Ministry of Social Development uh, has processes that is trying to get to know its clients eat better and to provide services through the use of ICT to provide relief for them in, in ways in which it is actually a lot easier to interact with them. The, if you take, for example, the income support grant. So the income support grant is really being handled almost entirely electronically, which brings with it all of the efficiencies that you get 
but it reduces face-to-face -face pieces with it. And then, of course, it also provides another level of anonymity. anonymity. The part about the introduction of technology to, to the social services, social development piece, is that it has significant, it will, as it continues to go, significantly reduce the levels of malfeasance and all kinds of things that infest that because it removes certain amount of resources from the people that need it. We have people who double dip, triple dip, quadruple dip. I don't know how far dip they dip, but think about what they do. They remove resources that should be available for the vulnerable and the people who need it because they want more than they should have. The introduction of the technology that we put will address a lot of that and it will stop it. A little bit of advice as it relates to things that you can do for yourself to help in this scenario. And this is, I'm speaking here about women, children, the vulnerable. Girls in particular. Everyone seems to have wearable technology these days, Fitbit, something. And they use it to connect it to their phone and to get information about themselves, you know, oxygen level, heart rate, sleep patterns, etc., etc. But the wearable technology that doubles as tools to assist women and girls, people in general, but women and girls in particular, to stay safe. There's wearable fashion that is connected to a solution called the Neighborhood Solution. It's called Athena. And what it is connected to is basically a high temperate whistle. And it linked to a mobile app that activates when a button is pressed for three seconds. Now, why is that important? Well, the user can activate a loud alarm and a flashing light, providing, of course, the circumstances and the training that you should get allows you to know when to do that, in the event that you find yourself under severe threat. It also will alert local authorities and certain chosen contacts. You have things like that that deal even with old type Me Too phones, where you don't have access to broadband, where all you need to do is to simply set it the way it was and it uses SMS to get to where you need to get to. Um, as far as personal security, I'm not even gonna mention pepper spray, we dealt with that last week. I wanna deal a bit with stereotyping and changing the stereotypes as it relates to fundamental change, particularly now with our girls. STEM, software development and programming is among the biggest industries in the world today. Uh, science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics, STEM as we call it, is actually one of the most popular things you could get in high schools and other places. My sons are in it. But strange enough, when I go into that class, this is actually what you see. A lot of boys. It's almost like it's a masculine set of subjects. Well, that is not really true. We have to find ways to encourage more girls and young women to, to challenge and break these stereotypes. I mean, organizations such as Girls Who Code is a good example of that. Bring education and awareness you know, to, to, the, to the public about why it is important to provide equal opportunities in these areas for girls. This is addressing the problem at a different level and provide avenues for that type of education. Global nonprofits, girls in tech, for example, is another one, focus on girls who are passionate about technology and provide support and training for female entrepreneurs uh, in the startup tech space. All of this is happening, but a lot of that is also happening at the local level. The Ministry of Public Administration and Digital Transformation is partnering with a number of people to get things into that space. As I close, because I just wanted to touch on a number of those things in my contribution, I want to end where I started. That technology, while some people view it particularly in, with respect to what we're dealing with now, some people view it as one of the things that causes problems. And you will get that, you hear about the, the all the online pieces and so on. What I've sorted to do here, what I've tried to do here, is to get uh, an understanding that it is also 
part of the solution. And if you couple it with the pieces, people, process, the law, and the technology itself is the plant and machinery, we can effect the right type of transformation that will impact all of society to get us to where we want to go, to achieve the goals that you, uh, Senator Richards, want us to achieve. Uh, Madam President, I thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I have great pleasure in coming to the Senate today um, to contribute to this motion. I promise not to be longer than 20 minutes to allow my colleague and friend, the Honorable Senator Richards, to have a proper time to wrap up this very important debate. I'd like to thank Senator um, Bacchus for echoing what I believe needs to become reality in this country. Plant and machinery, people, processes, and law. And it really is a joy to contribute into a debate such as this, where everybody's literally on the same page. As we all agree that we need to do the very best we can. This is a topic that it's easy to intellectualize about. We need to do more. We need to work harder. But operationalizing solutions comes through tracking the very aspects of the plant and machinery, the people, the processes, and the law. So I stand before you as Attorney General in the five years that I had prior to this particular uh, incarnation in this new 2020 government, I can say confidently, 532 laws, regulations, and orders have passed under my hand. 532. And in Hitting that kind of process, significant work was ruled out. In 2015, we did not have a family and children division of the court. We did not have electronic appearances. We did not have judge-only trials. We did not have amendments to the Sexual Offenses Act, amendments to the Bail Act, Amendments to the Domestic Violence Act. We did not have double the number of judges legislatively moving from 36 to 64. We did not have the increase in the age of retirement for judges from 65 to 70. We did not have full magisterial immunity. We did not have a magistrate's court that operated with a registrar, not a clerk of the peace and administrative officer, but a registrar with a court office. We did not have the family proceedings rules, the children's proceedings rules, the criminal proceedings rules. We did not have a criminal division which birthed not only the criminal division, but the traffic court, the district courts. Nobody bothered to look at the process flow, where the data came to our conscious reflection and attention. What is the data? In 2015, when I became Attorney General, we had 146,000 cases in the magistrate's court every year. We took out 104,000 of those cases by motor vehicle and road traffic becoming violations. We took out 8,500 by decriminalizing marijuana. We are on the cusp of proclaiming the Administration of Justice Indictable Proceedings Amendments, a JIPA as we call it, to treat with 26,000 cases, which are preliminary inquiries in a different way leaving us 8,500 cases where the same 43 magistrates that we had in 2015 are now dealing with 8,500 matters 
and some of the 26,000 martyrs. In other words, then, the process reform, plea bargaining, judge-only trials, all of these things in the holistic conversation that we're talking about, each and every one, Senator, all of these things have become a reality. Which is why the motion that comes before us by Senator Richards asks for two things. The motion asks for a resolution that we have a legislative agenda published within three months and specifically a policy implementation plan. I can tell the honorable members of the Senate and the nation listening the following. Appointment of a Commissioner of Police Simplification Process. Agenda item number one in a legislative agenda. It was laid in the Senate yesterday. Private Security Bill number two. Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Amendments Legislation to Treat with PH Drivers number three. Sexual Offenses Amendments to introduce the Sexual Offenders Registry, passed in this House, now in the House of Representatives. Sexual Offenses Amendments, Offender Charges Register, Bill Drafted, Final Consultation coming ahead. Sexual Offenses, New Offenses for Revenge Pornography and for Voyeurism, already drafted. Bail amendments to treat with violent crimes against women and children already drafted. Sexual harassment legislation already drafted. Amendments to the Industrial Relations Act to bring to life the amendments for the sexual harassment already drafted. Amendments to the Equal Opportunities Act to treat with sexual harassment already drafted. We then come now to the cybercrime legislation the whistleblowing bill, the trafficking in persons amendments, further amendments to domestic violence, the Evidence Act amendments, the firearms amendments to allow for a different management of the municipal police in this area of the law, firearms amendments to also include how we catch modified devices that are used against women like tasers or other things to debilitate people, and, of course, the firearms amendment to treat with pepper spray, which is in the House of Representatives. The gaming bill, which is now going to the House of Representatives. The amendments to the Trafficking in Persons Act. And further amendments to the Anti-Gang Act and the Electronic Payment Legislation. 22 pieces of law already prepared. Because, Madam President, as Attorney General, I have not been asleep in discharge of the functions entrusted to me by this Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, and this government. But what good is the law if we can't pass the law? See, I heard Senator Marx say a number of things, but I am also intimately aware that law is as good as its ability to function after it is passed into law. Isn't it not a demonstration of protecting the most vulnerable in our women and children to pass gaming legislation? So that our women can have bank accounts and not have to walk around with cash or to be treated in circumstances where they are not part of formal employment because the sector is unregulated? Isn't it true to say that the evidence amendments to introduce witness anonymity so that women and children who are vulnerable can give evidence where they are protected Isn't it true to say that whistleblowing protection applies to the protection of women and children? But you see, all of these are bills that the UNC will not support. All. All. 
And therefore, the reason why I have come here this evening, this afternoon, Madam President, is to specifically speak to the listening and viewing population of Trinidad and Tobago through you, Madam President, to say, it is only your voice. And I want to thank Senator Rambajan, who spoke elegantly, as always, every time she does, for saying, I am woman, I will roar. Let me hear you roar. Senator Rambajan was right. It is the roar that is required to demand that the opposition support legislation to protect our most vulnerable. It was that roar that prevailed when the opposition said no to abolishing child marriage. Imagine that I had an uphill task as Attorney General to convince the official opposition of this country, led by Mrs. Kamla Passad Bissessa, to convince the members of the opposition that child marriage was inappropriate in a democracy such as ours. Who could imagine that that could be a real debate in this house? Who? You see, we need to be precise. The amendments to the electronic payments, I recall the opposition refusing to support the payments into an out-of-court legislation. And that was a piece of law that brought dignity to women who had to receive maintenance payments, to children who had the right to be maintained, to men who had the indignity of being falsely accused or the payments being lost. I recall vividly the opposition saying no to the criminal division. And what did that criminal division bring for us? A brand new system of managing our criminal justice system. We have the parole legislation, which is another bill that I have not mentioned, which is part and parcel of this whole dynamic. Because if we're going to talk about releasing people back into society, the programs that you sign on to, to ensure that you are in a recovering state and condition are necessary for discussion. I agree that the holistic approach has to be applied. But my exhortation to Trinidad and Tobago is talk about the issues and what you support or do not support. When the government says that it is prepared, as I have drafted the law already, to make revenge pornography a crime, what is the issue? Do you support it? Do you not? You see, law must be applied and our version of the law in our society, as this Senate will be invited to be considered, has to decide what is the different view of Trinidad and Tobago that we want to create. Can we dare to have a vision of Trinidad and Tobago that is different and better than where we are at present? To do that, you have to be for or against an issue at times, or make constructive criticism at times, but you have to have the courage to start. You have to have the courage to be committed to saying, I believe that witness lives matter, and therefore I support witness anonymity to protect our children and protect our women. I believe that a sexual offenses register for charges may be appropriate in a country such as ours with sufficient safeguards. 
And if I put that in the context of the pH regulations, as we regulate the pH industry, I can tell you that the amendments to the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act are technologically driven. You see, we already have in the policy side and prescription side the fact that every driver in the higher industry, buses, maxi taxis, rental cars, private hire cars, as they will become a feature of, of registration, all of them would have to be registered. All of them will involve an identification of who the driver is. All of it will be back-end checked so that the convictions and charges in relation to drivers are known. All of them will allow for a phone to simply scan a QR code, whether you have data or not, because you can cache the data. And that's why Senator Bacchus was so right. Plant and machinery, people, processes, and law must unite. But I say to you, Madam President, what good is all of that respectfully if I face an opposition that cannot explain its refusal to support laws of the kind that I have just mentioned. Why is witness anonymity not supportable? Why is whistleblowing protection not supportable? Why are bail amendments not supportable? Why is the gaming legislation not supportable to drive out criminality and to protect the vulnerable in society? Why is the leader of the opposition silent? on all of these issues. I see as I come to a close, I will certainly be able to produce on behalf of the government a legislative agenda with immediacy, because clearly we have one. COVID has interrupted our ability to publish the agenda in the normal way that we do, because it was basically turned upside down. I can say with respect to the latter part, which is the policy implementation aspects, that might be a slightly different aspect because the implementation of policy is a little bit deeper than a prescriptive formula may allow to say this is the checklist for implementation. So I can certainly give the undertaking and commitment to oblige by the outcome of this motion as it relates to a policy prescription that is short, but as it relates to an agenda which is clear and precise. I thank Senator Richards for bringing this motion and for this opportunity to contribute. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Richards. Thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to bring closure to this motion, which states, whereas the statistics on violent crimes against women and girls have been widely reported by the TTPS, from late 2020 to present, and whereas said reports have garnered nationwide focus and given rise to several accounts of similar experiences by women whose cases have, have not been followed up and solved by police, and whereas the public has consistently called for the passage of legislation and improvements to the service delivery of public agencies in relation to inter alia, non-lethal weapons, transportation and judicial process to support the protection of women and girls against violent crimes. Be it resolved, the Senate called on the government to critically assess the deficiencies in the current systems to deal with the incidents of violent crimes against women and girls. And be it further resolved that the government present to the parliament within three months a legislative agenda and policy implementation plan to more effectively address the rising incidents of violence against girls and women. Madam President, through you, I'd like to offer my sincerest and deepest thanks to colleagues uh, who all made absolutely amazing contributions, 17 of them, including in the, on the first day of this debate, uh, Minister Rambarat, Senator Rambarat, Senator Lachmidial, Senator Tom Snai, Senator Honorable Donna Cox, Minister of Social Development and Family Services, Senator Julian John, Senator Anthony Vera, Senator Bethelmy, Senator from today, Lizama Leasing, Senator Dr. Lynn Remy, Senator Rambachan, Senator De Freitas, 
Senator Nakid, Senator Dr. Dial Singh, Senator Mark, Senator Bacchus, and uh, just before me, the Honorable Attorney General. I thank you all for your stealing contributions and the fact that, for the most part, the tenor of the contributions and debate has been conciliatory and not particularly partisan. And I really thank you all for the heartfelt contributions. Madam President, safety is a human right, the right to protection. And we all clearly share the deepest pain about the situation related to the violence against girls and women in our country. We may not always see eye to eye on how to solve the issue or address the issue, but we certainly have the same passion for the protection of our girls and women. So the motion, I took my time to write it because I didn't want it to be condemnatory of the government in any way, because I think it's an all of country approach that must be undertaken. And taking that sort of tenor would have been counterproductive. It also sought to deal with the wider agency and mechanisms that can and should be coordinated effectively to see the kind of results we want. So what do we have? We have law, as the AG so eloquently identified. We've, we've passed a number of laws. We've amended a number of laws, all in the, interest of, um, in the interest of not only protecting girls and women, but also dealing with many societal ills and providing protections in a wide range of, of areas. We have the courts, we have the legislature, the parliament, we have the executive, we have the opposition, we have the independents, we have the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, the Defense Force, the Coast Guard, we have NGOs, we have faith-based organizations, we have the media, we have civil society, we have outrage. What we don't have is the results we want. We have all the elements, but we do not have the results we want. So it seems that there is something awry, something amiss in our collective approach. And I think that is coordination. I think very often what is happening is the various agencies and sectors are working in silos. And I'll go through a bit of what has worked in the UK in, part, in terms of my uh, contribution. But before that, let me just uh, do justice to some of the contributions of my honorable colleagues. And the AG just spoke about uh, the, the 36 to 64 judges. And I'm extremely happy, Honorable AG, through you, Madam, Ch Madam President, that the AG has put on the table officially the coming of sexual harassment legislation in Trinidad and Tobago. I think that is very important and commendable and long overdue because we cannot be talking about violence against women and girls and not have laws in place to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace in a country like Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you very much, uh, AG. And the AG also spoke about the law's ability to function and achieve the objectives. As I said before, we can use the, the, the social science and management uh, acronym SMART, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. That's important because we have to set goals. We can't be coming to the parliament every year, every six months, and the numbers and the statistics are getting worse. We have to start seeing some sort of a rest of the situation, and then we have to start seeing a decline in the situation consistently, and we have to monitor what is working and what is not working effectively. That's the only way we can make measurable progress. The progress can't be a knee-jerk reaction when the heinous crimes are committed. The progress has to be that we can tell the population, these are the statistics between 2019 and 2020, 2020 and 21, 2021 and 22, and the numbers are going down with a measurable target of possibly zero, idealistically. That's the only solution. That's the only response that the public is going to accept. Because every female, every girl or woman who is assaulted, molested, raped, or killed is a family in distress. And you can't take that back. That's a life almost destroyed that needs re rehabilitation. So thank you, Honorable Eiji, for your contribution. Senator Bacchus, I fully agree with you that the issue of technology has to drive the solution in Trinidad and Tobago. 
and, and the implementation of mechanisms by which women and girls can be empowered to be more digitally literate will also help the solution. My, what, I, what I would suggest is that the country needs a basic national Wi-Fi grid that nobody is ever offline at a basic level. That will go a long way in terms of keep, keeping people connected. Also, a, a national CCTV network that's connected to the national security grid that works in jurisdictions around the world where you almost never more than five minutes out of view of some sort of electronic monitoring device that can be used as evidence to track you to find you if, you're in, if you find yourself in trouble or to bring you to safety. So I, I, I applaud that and I think technology is the way to go to make the system more accountable and more efficient. Senator Dara Singh spoke about the issue of people power and citizen power and the global rally against violence against girls and women and the state cost to violence against girls and women. And I'll quote some statistics, statistics about what it cost the UK to remediate violence against girls and women. And you'll realize that in those jurisdictions, they've realized, like Trinidad and Tobago, if we are not proactive and preventative, it costs us more down the road when you add up all the agencies that have to use resources to catch up. So being proactive and being innovative is the way not only to protect women and girls, because every life is priceless, but also to uh, mitigate the cost of that if it's done effectively. Senator Mark spoke of crime suppression and punishment and gender equality, which I think is extremely important in this context. We don't have a general mindset or culture of gender equality in Trinidad and Tobago. We say all the right things, but our actions say something different on a daily basis, on a personal basis, on an interactive basis. So we know it's the right thing to say, but as a country, do we really act that? When we do cat calls in the streets, are we really respecting women? Is that gender equality? So we have to think about not only the government and the opposition and the parliament, but all our individual responsibility in promoting gender equality and gender respect and the socialization of our youth, not only girls but boys, but women and, 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 women and girls and, and boys, everyone. Senator De Freitas spoke uh, intelligently about the issue of coordination and the societal mindset and the systems process challenges. He also spoke about this, the education system, and I know, Senator uh, DeFatis, you dealt with the formal education system. But in psychology and sociology, you know that the informal education system is much more impactful because it, include, it includes family, religious bodies, community, sporting organizations, multimedia, social media, etc. So if the education system is telling a child, a young man, woman, one thing, and they go out into the wider society and the message is different, there's incongruence. So the child is confused. So we have to have a holistic education system, both formal and informal. And Senator Nackett brightly spoke about the importance of applying consistent uh, resources to the agencies. Senator Daniel Remy and the world strategy in terms of respect and the acronym, uh, relationships, empowerment, services, reduction of poverty, enabling environments, child and adolescent, training and a transfer of attitudes, beliefs, and norms, cultural change, which many other honorable senators spoke about. Senator Ram Bachan, ec uh, excellent contribution. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an English person, so I like diction and delivery. Your delivery is always very enjoyable to listen to. And not that the others aren't. Let me put that on the, on the record. But uh, Senator Ram Bachan said, you know, it's an irony that a man brought this motion. I don't think so, I disagree. I think as Senator DeFrey has said, that's the mindset that sometimes we get caught up in. And in these instances, there's no gender involved. We all have to be on board. So whether it's a man or woman who brought it, it doesn't matter. The, the fact is that it came because there was a need for it in Trinidad and Tobago. And men have to stand side by side and support women and vice versa. So I disagree with that, although I understand your intention. And I like the fact that Senator Amachan indicated that you are the creator of your own change uh, speaking to women. But we have to also understand that some women, because of their background and their socialization, they don't have the intrinsic motivation or the sense of agency to make that change without the support systems in society. All homes are not the same. 
Sometimes we think of the fact that we had two caring, loving parents. We had guidance. We had support systems where we went wrong because we all went wrong at some stage in our lives. That is not the case with everybody's home situation. Sometimes people grow up in situations where they have absolutely no guidance or they are taught to be victims. The example is modeled to them. So they, they don't have a, an intrinsic model sense of agency to make the changes they need, and they end up in a cycle repeating what they've gone for, what has happened for generations. So while I understand your intention, Senator Ambachan, sometimes some people need support and help. Senator Bethlehem spoke about the government's uh, interventions and the No Child Left Behind policy, uh, and also issues related to anger management, training in schools, and coping skills. Senator Vera, the laws and enforcement of laws and the mindset we have in Trinidad Tobago about sometimes having a, a, a big stick mentality. We, we don't seem to be able to act responsibly if we think no one is watching. And we have to take personal responsibility. And changes in attitude and culture must start with the youth and also be modeled by adults in society. So I'm saying, all, and, and everyone's contributions were very important because this is not a uh, single, a, a unidimensional issue. Everything is inter, interrelated, everything is intertwined, everything affects everything else. So it's not insular in any way, and we have to keep that in mind when we proffer solutions to these situations. He also spoke about the issues, the importance of positive, positive examples. Uh, about seven years ago, I had the uh, option to interview a mentorship program coming out of the Ministry of National Security, the TT Defense Force, out of my lot and my part. And they had uh, gentlemen who volunteered, were extremely well vetted, about 15 gentlemen, and they were trained in mentorship, and they took on the role of each mentoring five young men who found themselves in trouble. So the young men were put through a program, and these gentlemen, older gentlemen who had retired, had the time, wanted to give back and they mentored these young men to young adulthood, modeling some of the behaviors that they know would be productive to society. And the young men didn't have that in their lives before. And the program was so successful, I often wonder why these programs are stopped or not well promoted in Trinidad Tobago. We need mentorship. And I know there's a new Ministry of Youth and Youth Development and National Service. And I hope mentorship and national service uh, programs that are initiated and promoted by such a ministry. We also heard from Senator, uh, Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, Fisheries who spoke about the, the importance of having a safe transportation system in Trinidad and Tobago. That is critical. And I'm not too sure if I agree with the attempting to legalize the pH system, but that's another debate, <laughs> which we'll get into, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, in time, and, and all the other senators who would have contributed. I, I wish I could go through the whole list. I now realize how difficult it is for government ministers to pilot bills because then you have to listen to everybody and take notes <laughs> and respond. So, so I give you your commendations for doing that effectively. So, Madam President, on many occasions, I have received calls from friends and family members, females at hours of the night and early morning, crying on the phone, Screaming, come help me, please. I think he's going to kill me. I've done interviews in a series called Survivors, where I interviewed 25 women, many of whom were survivors of gender-based violence, domestic violence. Trisha was attacked by her partner, who chopped off her hand. She actually saw her arm on the ground in the process. She saw her arm, and she was, she, it was such a violent attack that she was wondering if the, the, the person attacked somebody else, and she was wondering, oh my God, he, he actually attacked somebody else, not even realizing it was her own arm. She fortunately survived. Unfortunately, society now re-victimizes her because she can't get a job, because she's differently able. So every job she tries to get, they look at her, she's qualified, and they don't want to hire her. So she feels re-victimized by society. Shanti. 34-year-old wife and mother. Happened to, what happened to her is, in her opinion, worse than actually death, when her husband chopped her, left her on the ground, and told her, I ain't gonna kill you, you know. I'm gonna hurt you worse. And proceeded to chop their seven-year-old son to death. 
and told her, I want, to, I want you to live because I know that will hurt you more than if I kill you. That is the kind of mindset that some of these people have, these, these uh, perpetrators have. And she had to live with that. Eventually, I think she, the, the grief just killed and Shanti passed away. Angela, who eventually became a minister of God, her story is one of a childhood stolen by her father who sexually abused her from the age of eight to 16. At 16, she had the agency to run away because she was an adolescent then. What is worse, she told her mother when she was 10 years old, daddy is doing me bad things. Her mother ignored her and allowed the abuse to continue for years to come until she got away. These are real stories. And I know everyone has experiences. I, I fail to mention Senator John, whom something she said stuck in my head when she indicated, I think it's, a, it's in a home setting, when a drink was tossed in someone's, in, 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 in one of the family members' space, and she asked, why, why is he doing that? You know, that, that sort of mindset in a child's or an adolescent's mind, it's difficult to process and it affects you for the rest of your life. Violence against women and girls uh, has been an issue not only Trinidad and Tobago, but around the world. So much so that in 2020, there was a commission enacted in the UK uh, by Her Majesty's government, and it's titled Violence Against Women and Girls, Strategy 2016, Ending Violence Again Against Women and Girls. And the opening paragraph indicates the prevalence of domestic and sexual violence and abuse has dropped according to the crime survey in England and Wales. And in 2014, 2015, saw prosecutions for victims against girls and women, violence against girls and women offenses reach the highest ever recorded. Significant new laws now in place, including specific offenses for stalking, forced marriage, failure to protect from female genital mutilation, revenge pornography, which the, the AG referenced, as well as new domestic abuse offenses to capture coercive and controlling behavior in an intimate family relationship. They've gone that far. Laws protect, protecting against coercive and controlling behavior because as one of my colleagues indicated, this is about power and control. I think it was Senator Mark. This is not about, in most instances, sexual, sexual gratification. It's about power and control. The cost to individuals cannot be measured, but the cost of violence and abuse to the economy can be calculated and has, and the costs are considerable. Sylvia Walby's report estimates that providing public services for intervention to victims of domestic violence and the lost economic output of women affected and cost the UK approximately 15.8 billion pounds annually. 15.8 billion pounds is what it takes to, for intervention and remediation services. So if we think it's not costing, and I mean the, the damage to the human soul is incalculable, but it's also costing the state. We see it every day by our failures in some sectors that we have to put into national security, by our failures in health and wellness promotion that we have to put into the Ministry of Health. We have to be proactive, not only to protect human life and dignity, but also to safeguard the economy. The cost of health, housing, and social services, criminal justice, and civil legal services is estimated at an additional 3.5 billion pounds. So now add 15.8 billion, 3.9 billion. We're getting to the 20 billion pound price tag annually for intervention against abuse against women and girls in the UK. I'm sure we have similar uh, metrics that we can proffer in terms of what is this costing the state. And as, as I said before, the cost to the taxpayer is one thing. The cost to the human being is incalculable. Some of the mechanisms that have worked, education, holistic education, starting from very young, national campaigns for culture change, opportunities for victims to seek help safely, effective perpetrator interventions, police response, including confidence in the criminal justice system. We have commendably, through Commissioner Griffith, initiated a gender-based unit, which is doing great work in the TTPS. And that is extremely commendable, commendable because what he's able to do through that is re train officers to more sensitively and effectively 
handle and manage reports of sexual abuse and domestic violence. And from my reports, it is working very well. And, and it's, it's just starting. Improved understanding of victim uh, violence against women and girls, in including coercive control and the importance of that element of it. Bystander reporting programs. So the AG spoke about whistleblower legislation and the ability to anonymously report crimes in neighborhoods. We all know in neighborhoods. The man was quote unquote beaten she. After it reaches the tragic state, everybody has something to say. After the, the, the PH driver in parentheses is apprehended, everybody in the, in the community knew, knew he had the propensity for, 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 to be a perpetrator, but nobody's reporting it because people don't feel safe enough that their, their, their report will be anonymous, and we live in a very small country. And that's part of the issue. So if mechanisms aren't provided where people really feel extremely safe in terms of their ability to report anonymously, we're going to have less public participation. Evidence-led prosecutions, the courts are very important. Enhanced support through the criminal justice system for victims. The effective use of new technology, Senator Baker spoke about that. Highly technologically driven. Integrated family intervention and approaches, because you could do one thing in the school and at home is hell. It has to be holistic and integrated. And effective sanctions for breaches. To meet the increasing challenge and to continue the results they're seeing, the UK government is set to spend an additional $80 million pounds, sorry, annually because they're seeing the results. So they want to continue the trend forward, and that is also commendable. And 15 million additional pounds uh, that the government is uh, finding through uh, taking a percentage of VAT from the national purse is to provide for sanitary products for women and girls who can't afford it, and intervention and training services for those girls. So, there's a, a, a Women's Aid and Self -Life, Safe Lives initiative that is also working with the government as an NGO to help the British government in this intervention. So again, it's not only on the shoulders of the government, because the government can't do everything. The, the society is not the government. The society is the people of the country. And everyone, every sector, agencies, faith-based organizations, civil society, everyone has to play their part. But someone has to coordinate it so it doesn't operate in silos. The new government programs announced will cost an additional 200 million pounds already invested in a program called the Troubled Families Program. And a further 720 million pounds will be put into, or has been put in the program through 2020. So they're seeing where the investment needs to go. They have to fix societal family problems because if we can't do the interventions in the family, which is where the mindset and the culturalization, socialization starts, we are going to have to be coming behind the curve all the time. So I think this is a very uh, important aspect of it in terms of looking at it. Senator Richards, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Madam President. Quickly, I looked at the national policy and gender de and development from the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago Office of the Prime Minister, dated February 2018, which is a green paper. And it states that the uh, gender policy is driven by a philosophy that is fundamental human rights, freedom and dignity of the human person guaranteed to all women, men, girls and boys. The policy commits to preserving the equal and inalienable rights of men, women, boys and girls in Trinidad and Tobago as guaranteed under the Constitution. It's a lot I wanted to read but I'm going to have to skip past that because of the limited time. The policy makes the following commitments regarding legislative reforms, promoting gender e equity enforced by strong equal opportunities legislation informed by a national gender policy. Amend maternity protection, champion legislation to provide universal maternity benefits, enact legislation to ensure equal opportunity for the, in the workplace. And I'm glad, as I said, the, the AG referenced it earlier, legislation to deal with the issue of uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, which is very important, which provides an env environment for gender equity in the workplace in Trinidad and Tobago, and also moving legislation forward to have more parity in terms of remuneration packages, because women are still getting, on average, less than men in the workplace. And Madam President, you know, as I close, one of the greatest advantages that this country has is the passion for this. 
It's called a criminal justice system. Justice is very prominent there. Justice denied is a travesty in any, any society. We have to deal with our systems uh, holistically. The TTPS, National Security, Ministry of Transport, Social Services, Education, and your faith-based organization, judiciary, le legal fraternity, media, all have to come together to play their parts. It is important that we understand the opportunity here and we do not waste it at this important juncture in our country's history. We have an opportunity collectively to make a difference and deal with this once and for all because women and girls have a right to feel safe in Trinidad, Tobago. They don't know. They have a right to feel safe in the country of their birth and our visitors to these shores too. Madam President, I thank you. And with those few words, I beg to move. Honorable Senators, the question is, be it resolved that this Senate call on the government to critically assess the deficiencies in the current systems to deal with the incidents of violent crimes against women and girls. And be it further resolved that the government present to the Parliament within three months a legislative agenda and policy implementation plan to more effectively address the rising incidents of violence against women and girls. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This motion has therefore been carried. Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I beg to move that this Senate do now adjourn to a date to be fixed. Honorable Senators, before I put the question on the adjournment, leave has been granted for two matters to be raised. Senator Mark. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, the first issue I want to address is what I call um, self-home or home self-isolation. And I raise this matter because we have to draw very, very powerful lessons from our experiences thus far. Madam President, as we speak, we have had today 215 new cases and 14 deaths. And the tally is 761. Madam President, as we speak, on this very important motion, there are some 7,170 persons in home self-isolation at this time. At one time, we, am, we may have had over 10,000 in home self-isolation. We are concerned, Madam President, about the protocols that have been employed and deployed to deal with this issue of citizens 
who have been tested positive but have been confined to home quarantine or, as I said, home self-isolation. Madam President, Madam, uh, Mr. Vice President, caregivers, in the absence of what I call clear, defined protocols, have themselves become victims of contracting and becoming infected with this deadly COVID-19 virus. Because, Mr. Vice President, of three factors, the failure to properly test, the inadequacy of professional manpower, and capacity problems surrounding the laboratory. Mr. Vice President, we would like the government to clear the air on the kind of protection, the kinds of protocols that have been provided and established for those citizens who happen to be caregivers and who happen to be in self-isolation. And as I said, some 7,107, according to data supplied to us today, are now in home self-isolation. The question or questions that I would like to put to the government are as follows. How many of those persons, the 7,170 persons who have been infected and are in home self-isolation are provided with N95 masks? How many of them? This is a question that we need to ask and we need answers. How many of them are provided with face shields by the state? Because they cannot be in hospitals or they cannot be in facilities called quarantine facilities. So they are asked to be at home, take care of those loved ones who are infected at home. But is the state providing the N95 masks? Is the state providing, Mr. Vice President, the protective face shields? What about hand sanitizers? Are these provided by the state to these 7,170 persons? Mr. Vice President, when people, just as how I came into this booth, you have somebody spraying this place because you don't want anyone to become accidentally infected. How many citizens who are in home self-isolation are provided with the kind of disinfectant or sanitizers or spray to provide protection for their families from the ones who are infected at home. We don't know. But we get reports that after they provide you with the tests and they tell you to go home, Mr. Vice President, that is the medical people or the health officials, how they seem to have left these people on their own. And some of these people, Mr. Vice President, we have seen and read horror story, horror stories of care, caregivers dying while administering to their loved ones. Because why? 
the government of Trinidad and Tobago has not taken an interest in providing these people with the relevant materials and supplies to take care of themselves and their families. So many of them have died as a result of this development. Mr. Vice President, many persons who are home in self-isolation because the government has not set up a system to provide them with food and medicines. Some of them have to leave their homes and mix with the larger population in order to secure food from the supermarkets and groceries and the shops. And many of them have to go in the drugstores, the pharmacies, to buy pharmaceuticals because the government of Trinidad and Tobago has not established a system to provide through our NGOs and civil society organizations that can be very useful in this kind of exercise with that kind of ability to know where these people are and to provide them with food, whether it is lunchtime or in the evening time, as the case may be, or to provide them with medicine that they need rather than they have to leave home, Mr. Vice President, and mix up with the population Senator, out there. you have two more minutes. So, Mr. Vice President, in closing, I want to ask the government to take a page out of the book of Barbados. Mr. Vice President, I have come across something called, it is called a Bluetooth wrist temperature gauge. Where, Mr. Vice President, that is placed on your wrist. Once you are tested positive, it takes your temperature every half an hour automatically. And it sends that signal back to the administrator within the hospital environment so they know how your temperature is reading, Mr. Vice President. And if you leave that room that you are in self-isolation, that you have been quarantining, they are able to track your movement. Why can't we provide the, that risk? Um, Bluetooth temperature gauge to our 7,170 citizens who are currently infected with this virus, Mr. Vice President. Why? Small Barbados have been able to do so. Why can't Trinidad and Tobago, a rich country, even though we are under pressure, we still have some money, Mr. Vice President, to deal with our sick citizens. So I'm calling on the government to account. That is why we have called for a commission of inquiry into the management of this COVID-19 madness. So, Mr. Vice President, my time is limited. I call on the government to account, to give an account of this situation as it relates to protocols involving our citizens who are in home self-isolation. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Leader of Government Business. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, in presenting the motion, and let me recite the motion for Senator Mark's understanding. The motion calls upon points to the need for the government to explain the specific measures being used to monitor and evaluate COVID-19 positive patients in home quarantine. And in, in defense of a motion that is not before us, Senator Mark has string, strung together immense number of fallacies, unsubstantiated statements, and a sprinkling, and I'm stretching it by saying sprinkling of facts. In fact, I should use singular there, a fact. And that single fact is that there are now, as of today, 7,170 persons in self-quarantine. 
So Mr. Vice President, and, the, and, and what is presented and ob, unsubstantiated are those three factors which Senator Mark spoke about. Failure to properly test. Well, Mr. Vice President, as of today, 218,568 tests have been conducted. So that, is, that does not demonstrate any failure to properly test, and that is in the public and private system. He's presented, he's presented the statement about inadequacy of manpower. Mr. Vice President, the numbers are now declining. Unfortunately, we still have deaths and we still have positives and our condolences go out to all those families, those who have suffered loss of relatives and those who have had to deal with the pain that comes with having a positive member of the family. But the fact is that even at the peak of the positives, when we were touching on 700 and something cases a day, even at the peak, nowhere in the healthcare system has there been an inadequacy of manpower. Trinidad and Tobago very uniquely has been able to maintain its parallel healthcare system. And even at that peak, and I hope that we never get back anywhere near that, there's been no demonstration of inadequacy of, of manpower. And then the third factor which Senator Mark points to, capacity problems of manpower. Well, once Senator Mark starts to talk about capacity, I stood here in response to a question, and a question from Senator Mark in which there was a demand that we close the Brooklyn facility in Sandy Grandi, which was a step-down facility for which the government had a three-month contract, and Senator Mark was demanding that that be closed. And I said in response, the cost of keeping it on a month-to-month -month basis, in case it is needed, will far outweigh the, 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 the cost. The cost, just the, the rent we were paying, far outweighed the cost of having to reestablish a facility. And we've proven right about that. So those three factors in support of a motion that is not presented, they, they are unsubstantiated, Mr. Vice President. The fact is, in relation to patients in, in home quarantine, the first thing is that the government has followed the WHO and CDC guidelines in relation to self-quarantine measures. They're not perfect, I'm sure. They're not perfect but they, they represent what are the WHO and CDC guidelines. In relation to that part of the motion, which has not been presented, that del deals with monitoring and evaluation, the Ministry of Health has implemented a telemedicine strategy. There are 150 officers who were trained specifically to pro pro provide that support to persons who are in home quarantine, 150 officers. That is not a sign of neglect. And those 150 officers are required to do five things in relation to home quarantined persons. One, to conduct the tracing in respect of these persons. Two, to track and monitor those patients and provide ongoing medical advice towards their recovery. Well, what could be better than that? Being assigned, you're talking about 150 of officers. We've now gotten to the point of 7,170. So you're talking about 150 officers being assigned to on average at the peak 50 patients who are in home quarantine and provide them with ongoing medical advice towards their recovery. There is a tracking system, and they require, those officers are required to track the positive patients who were supplied with pulse oximeters to manage, record, and report on the status of their oxygen levels. The fourth thing is that if 
it is found that these patients exhibit readings be below the required level, the arrangements being made in place for these patients to be moved for treatment, immediate treatment at three facilities. These patients who are in self-isolation, the arrangements being made for them to be moved to Coover, Cora, and Augustus Long Hospital. And then finally, Mr. Vice President, this home quarantine is not a holiday. It, it is conducted under the force of law. And you're required, before you go into home quarantine, you're required to sign a quarantine order. And that order is enforceable by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. So the ministry collaborates with the police to ensure the order is complied. And if you have people who know they are positives, you're pleading for, 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 for them, and we've put all these arrangements. If you have persons who are positive and who are prepared to go into supermarkets and go outside and shop and, and so on, then the law has to be enforced. The law has to be enforced, and the, and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is the entity to enforce those laws. So throughout, in relation to, to persons who are in home quarantine, self-isolation, the Ministry of Health continues to provide the support to the officers, these 150 officers, and particularly in relation to certain things that must be done, and the must be done is to stay at home and isolate from others, to ensure that they use separate facilities and they do not share utensils and so on, they don't go to work, they do not allow visitors, they wear masks and, and they have food and medication and, and so on. And if it is that someone who has been, has, has been in home quarantine, not only for the, the facility of moving because of Minister, a medical you have two more issue, minutes. The facility of moving to one of the facilities, if the oxygen level falls, is one thing. But I am sure, Mr. Vice President, that if somebody in home quarantine is unable to maintain themselves in home quarantine, there are state facilities provided. There are state facilities provided for quarantine, and they may have access to that. So, Mr. Vice President, this is not an issue. There's nothing. There is nothing presented here today. There's nothing known to any one of us. And there's nothing that has been demonstrated. When we compare ourselves with the rest of the world to suggest that there's been a failure of the government, and in particularly those professionals who work in the Ministry of Health and elsewhere, and those frontline people who risk their lives to provide the support that I'm speaking about. There's no evidence before us or otherwise of failure to properly test, inadequacy of manpower, or capacity problems. And I, I refer to the difficult period we've just gone through, the anticipation that our arrangements could be broken if the numbers escalate. The measures that this country and the citizens of this country have had to endure, and the fact that they have worked so far on our health system, the existing, pre existing, or the COVID system, they have not broken down. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, the second matter I wish to raise deals with the status or the status of the private-public or public-private partnership agreement or arrangement with involving, I should say, the Aripo Livestock Farm or station. Mr. Vice President, approximately one year ago, I raised this matter via a private member's motion. To be precise, it was on the 23rd of June, 2020, 
that I raised this matter. And I sought to get clarification from the government on the transparency, accountability, and to get from the government how was this process in handing over 1,176 acres of agricultural lands. Of course, many parts of that um, acreage we know is under forest, essentially. But I wanted to get from the government an understanding of the process because we wanted transparency and accountability. I call on the Minister of Agriculture then, as I would call on him now, to give us an understanding, provide us with information as to the terms and conditions of the lease. I call on him then, as I call on him now, to make public that particular lease agreement. He did not do it then, and I shudder to think he will do it now. There is secrecy surrounding this entire transaction involving the hijacking of our 1,176 acres of agricultural lands, a repo livestock farm, and it is purported to have been given to some person who apparently is a powerful goat and sheep farmer in this country who is a big sawati in a private company called General Earth Movers Limited. And he's also in charge of this farm in Pinal called Maralesa Farms. This individual, Mr. Vice President, one by the name of Lincoln Takuri, or Takure, he is now in charge of the Aripo Livestock Farm. And we have information where they recently entered into a MOU with Nestle, right? To supply them with um, local fresh cow's milk, Mr. Vice President. So this company seems to be going very well. I want to know what are the benefits accruing to the taxpayers of this country. Because this company has been given by this criminal administration 1176 acres of prime of land, agricultural lands. Mr. Vice President, without any proper accountability, transparency in this whole exercise. Mr. Vice President, I was shocked, amazed, when I looked at what has taken place. And the Minister of Agriculture has to account today for this travesty that has taken place. Mr. Vice President, we demanded and we demand today that the minister put onto the public, put on the table of parliament, lay on the table of parliament the lease agreement. We need to get that so we will understand what are the terms and conditions. Mr. Vice President, on the 18th of August 2019, a company was incorporated. Never in our wildest dreams did the Minister of Agriculture in his private partnership agreement and in his statement on the 23rd of June 2019, 2020 rather, told us that a private limited liability company was being established. We never knew that, Mr. Vice President. We went into the registry, the company's registry, to see register and incorporated on the 13th of August, 2019, some a company by the name of Aripo Livestock Limited. When we looked at the incorporated documentation, we saw two names that appeared. 
and we say, but these people are not involved in a repo. These are now directors. The names are Harold Ramuta Singh and Karina um, Chunidas Ramnat, both from the same address. Number two, Makoya Road to Napuna. And so we ask what this thing is about. Is this a front? Are these people fronting for the real people who are now owning our 1,176 acres of land and they have now formed a company? So we've gone from a leasehold arrangement, Mr. Vice President, where the minister gave no indication that Marilessa was going to establish a company to run the operations of this farm. But it becomes curiouser and curiouser, like Alice in Wonderland. Mr. Vice President, the, all of a sudden, Mr. Vice President, on the 23rd of August, 2019, you remember they were formed sometime on the 13th of August, 2019, a couple of days later, on the 23rd, these two directors, Harold Ramuta Singh and somebody called Karina Chunidas Ramnath, vacated their directorship. And who took over? A fellow called Lincoln Takure and another person called Judy Takure. So they are now in charge of this place called the Aripo Livestock Limited. No, at no time in, at all did the Honorable Minister tell this country. Senator, you have two more minutes. That they, yes, Mr. Vice President, that this company was going to be formed. We were told about a lease agreement. We were, talk about a, we were told about a private public partnership agreement. So, Mr. Vice President, we want answers from the minister. And, Mr. Vice President, when I looked at the incorporated documents, no shares issued at this time. No shares issued at this time. We don't know who are the shareholders of Aripo Livestock Limited. We don't know who are the beneficial owners of a repo livestock limited. Mr. Vice President, we need answers. We need them now. This appears to be a sophisticated hijacking of our lands. 11,076 acres of land being hijacked by the government on behalf of their friend. And we need answers. Why was this company formed, Mr. Vice President? And why did not the minister tell this parliament that this company was going to be formed when I asked the minister back in June of 2020, what was this lease about? Lay the lease on our table of parliament. Let us see the terms and conditions. None of these things were done. We have to go, Mr. Vice President, into the company's registry to discover a company called Aripo Livestock Limited was formed with the two companies, directors, who are the owners of the Marilessa Farm Limited. Mr. Vice President, all we ask is for the minister and the government to come clean and tell us what is behind this entire fiasco that has now gripped this farm that was once owned, once owned by the people of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you very much. Leader of Government Business. Mr. Vice President, the first and foremost mystery before us is the fact that my colleague allegedly graduated from the Institute of Business with an EMBA. And knows and, and that graduation is preceded by a degree from the same UE in economics. Two, two, two areas which also form part of my background. And I'm embarrassed both as a graduate and as a lecturer of that university to know that this big man cannot understand 
the basics of a public-private partnership. This is our second expedition. The first was a night late one night when I put a serious licking on him. <laughs> Beaten with the facts and the truth. Because this is not Mamu and Beatam, wastewater. Where Mamu gone, the money gone, and all that the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago get in the wastewater project is pipe. <laughs> From tongue to central, all that we get is pipe. And that is because I now understand you do not have an idea of how business functions in this world. How did you exit that institution? I call for an inquiry today, not only as a graduate of UWE, on multiple occasions, but as a former faculty member from that institution, I am ashamed that you do not understand. An advertisement went out, I went through that. An advertisement went out. Site visits, extension of time, I went through that. Bids received, chaired. Are you, are you casting aspersions? on retired P.S. Vishnu Danpal. He chaired the committee. The committee was made up of technocrats. Are you casting aspersion on the present acting permanent secretary in the Ministry of Sport, who was then the deputy P.S. in the Ministry of Agriculture, who was on the committee? No deal with your motion. You asked me for a status report. And tonight, you ask for a status report, and I'm giving the country a status report on your intelligence and your understanding and your abuse okay, of... Okay, Senator Mark. Minister, 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 one moment. Senator Mark, please allow the minister to make his contribution. No, no one wants to do your exam in secret. This is a scandal. Uh, this I am, I am embarrassed. Okay, 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 okay. The honorable member is not dealing with emotion. He's dealing with a person. He's dealing with my personal. I am not dealing with personality, but I am dealing with facts. What's, what's his Don't deal with no personality. Senator Mark, what is his standing order? You, you call the number, what's his standing order? Saying that 46 4. Minister, 46 4. Mm -hmm. To rule on it. Okay, no problem. Okay, Minister, just temper your responsibility. Mr. Vice President, I am not imputing proper mo improper motives in relation to my friend. I'm re imputing improper motives in relation to the institution that granted him the EMBA. This has to be wrong because the process of a public private partnership is that the state enters into a relationship, a partnership, not like the people's partnership, <laughs> with a corporate entity. And the bid was in the name of the existing entity, Maralisa Limited. And once, the, once they were selected through this process, and this company is not, this company did not put in a bid to steal as of today, this company has invested $28 million of their money. Who signs up? I mean, listen, I am, I am, I am flummoxed. <laughs> I can't even write a conspiracy theory or a mystery novel in which somebody goes through a very complex a very complex way of stealing from themselves. It's their money, and they have invested $28 million. I've gone through the process with you. The reason our company was formed was to facilitate, and I mean, you want to hide. You want to hide and form a company, and you'll call it Aripo Livestock Limited. <laughs> There's a reason that company was formed and named to continue, 
I mean, so it is a corporate vehicle. Once they bid as Maralisa, and we entered into the MOU, they then formed the corporate vehicle, Aripo Livestock Limited, which is the partner of the state. The state owns the land and is making it available. They're paying rent for the land, you know? Half a million dollars a year. And there's a partnership, a public-private partnership. And you refer to the MOU with Nestle as though it's a sin. Listen, this company is taking its money. It's established, it's established forage facilities so that they could manufacture their own feed. They've expanded the irrigation system. They've moved the water. The, the, the water storage alone has moved from 150,000 gallons to 18 million gallons. It costs money. They've employed people. They've created opportunities for UTT students to be trained. And they've entered into an MOU with Nestle, as you correctly said. Mm -hmm. They did it in my presence. It just so happened that this morning I went to True Value and bought yet again my Nestle local milk with the national flag. And I've said to the country that, you know, there's a lot of things that, that give us pride in this country. But you know, for me, to reach into my refrigerator and pull out local milk with the national flag, it's the only Nestle product anywhere in the world that carries a national flag. And the intention, there are many, many things will come out of a repo. But that MOU, by 2025, that single facility in a repo will double the production of local milk in Trinidad and Tobago. 2025, right there down the road. And they're on, they're on course to do that. Minister, Nestle, you have two more minutes. Nestle does not deal with any and anybody on that basis. Nestle doesn't go out of to, 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 to enter into an MOU, but they have assessed the facilities. They were very proud. The country head was there. We spent almost the entire day there at the facility. And so far, so far what has happened at, at the facility, you know you're not talking about what, what it was. You're not talking about what it was. Mm -hmm. You're talking about what it is in your head. But I've already established what's in your head. <laughs> so the ir irrigation, I've said, they've gone into grass production. So they've, they've established 40 acres of elephant grass. They've done uh, two cycles, 60 acres each of corn production. They, have no they now have the capacity to handle the harvest from 100 acres of corn. They've developed the silos for storage. They've expanded the, the pond, the, the, the water, the water storage on the on the acreage to up to 18 million, 18 million gallons. And they continue to do what under the MOU we agreed that they will do. And it is on the on the animal side where they project by, by 2025 to have a thousand animals there imported brought there at their cost that will provide local beef and animals that will provide milk. And as I said, the objective is by 2025, we will double the milk production. They will also bring along local farmers. They will just establish an automated milking parlor as they have in Pinal up at that facility. And they will work with students, with farmers. They'll work with the industry. Because that is what we need. We don't need the state to be paying people to mine animals. We need that sort of private investment in the industry. Thank you very much. Honorable Senators, the question is that this... Senators, would you, would you allow Sorry, me to? Yeah, all right. Thank you. No Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now adjourn to a date to be fixed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no.
I think the ayes have it. The Senate now stands adjourned to a date to be fixed.